we will soon no longer be able to fulfill that promise since growth will outstrip resources. There is only one break for overpopulation, namely that the only ones who may survive and procreate are those who can support themselves. So the only people who you say are, are in a position where they're um, economically fit at, at the current moment, in, in, independent of the amount of injustice, you know, you're not looking at the the role of the, the IMF, the World Bank, to consciously keep people at a state of intrinsic poverty and, and economic insecurity. The point that he's coming at is that if you are not, if you are economically fit to sustain your family, you may procreate. If you're not, you may not procreate. If you're just, um, and let's sort of, that's the idea of the Herbert Spencer social Darwinism, you know, in opposition to the, the Galton, Francis Galton idea. So you had this whole debate about a century before that, that quote between two different um, British imperial thinkers who were both taking Darwin's theory of evolution, which is not really a true scientific theory at all, yeah. especially the idea of the survival of the fittest, and, and having a false debate over how to apply it to human systems, where Herbert Spencer, who coined the term social Darwinism, took a liberal approach saying, no, if we just let everything be and let, let the competition go, the unfit will be destroyed by the fit, and you will have just a, a, a natural ordering, like Darwin says, occurs in nature, with no regulation. And then, you know, Darwin's cousin uh, Galton said, no, 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 no. You need strong government top-down controls to manage this, the science of global uh, purification of the gene pool. Welcome, Matthew Arad, we are live and recording. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, Kevin. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Um, so listen, I, I've been listening and reading a lot of your stuff and Cynthia's by, by your wife's uh, stuff too. I hope she's going to have some time soon because she had, I think, a lot of stress. And so we had to postpone the... Uh... Yeah, the, the deadlines Deadlines sometimes can weigh heavily. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think she, she's navigating through the storm pretty well, uh, executing the to-do list. But <laughs> yeah, hopefully that, that works out. No, she does great, you know, amazing stuff, amazing content. I loved her, you know, her work on you know would it be technology or history or i mean both of you are just just mind-boggling the, the the amount of 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 content you put into i don't sometimes i'm wondering you know where you take the the energy you know the time and the... <laughs> try to stay zen try to, but uh actually you're gonna really enjoy we we just finished working on a new film based on her uh her essay it's going to be part of a six-part series each one's about 20 minutes long and we just finished the first one um, it's going to be pseudo animated as well to bring in why there are no limits to, to human progress. Um, introducing a lot of the, uh, the false Malthusians that like the ideology of, of, uh, limits to growth that was introduced politically, not scientifically in the seventies. And, um, it'll be a sharp video series, but we're going to make it available, uh, next week or so. So oh, I'll, I'll send you a yeah. link. Yeah, I think I, I read that uh, that comment or whatever that that post that you did. Yeah, um, on on what, what was it on Twitter, Telegram, where you said, "Yeah, you're gonna you know transform this into more document," which I thought it was it's great, you know, documentary because you're gonna reach much more, of course, much more people. Yeah, you know, especially if you do it in a you know very suspensing, <laughs> suspenseful and thrilling way. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you mentioned Malthusian, so this is what we're going to talk about amongst other stuff. Um, so I read your article, by the way. Uh, it's a great article. I mean, um, now the thing is, I remember in our one of our first interviews we had, maybe it was the first chat we had, you, we just touched upon it very superficially, you know, on Austin economics. And you had, as I just remember, I'm just, I, I don't even want to paraphrase you, but you had sort of a more uh, critical or, yeah, critical point of view or, you know, in, in regards to Austin economics or Austin economy or Austin economists. Uh, now, in that article, which uh, maybe let me just um, put this on the screen just for the listeners uh, and viewers. Um, mm -hmm. It's called, uh, what's the name of the, yeah, it's called, uh, yeah, the Keynes versus Van Hayek debate, a false dualism with Malthusian characteristics. And mm -hmm. uh now the thing is, I mean, uh, you know, uh, as you know, I, I'm a Bitcoin. It's a, a focus. My bit, my podcast is focused on Bitcoin, and 
it's always you know rooted in Bitcoin. Everything I talk about, more or less. Uh, but uh, Hayek, you know, got pretty much a lot of you know. Uh, uh, let's say he's he's got well known, you know, in the Bitcoin community because of this. Uh, there was one quote of him. I think he he had uh, he did a, a, a interview. I think it was television or some decade, many decades ago before he died, and um, and he said something like, you know, about a sly roundabout, you know, how you can create a better money, you know, uh, is something that I'm just paraphrasing. It's something that governments cannot touch, cannot destroy, you know, and which is totally like uh, isolated from the from government and nation states. And that's that's the quote that's sort of got more famous within the Bitcoin circles. Now, I didn't know about the, uh, uh, I know, I know, you know, a lot about Keynes because I read, you know, uh, all the books of, of Safed and Amos. He's a really great, awesome economist, a scholar, and he used to be a professor himself and did a lot of research. Uh, you know, some of these books is really great, like Bitcoin Standard, the Fiat Standard, and now the new one, the Principles of Economics. We also talked about, you know, the uh, the character of Keynes. He, by the way, he was. He seems to be. There were some, you know, correspondence letters from the Oxford Library or something that where it came out. He was a, uh, you know, a fucking pedophile. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So it says a lot, you know, also about the economy. A terrible, and terrible, economy. terrible human being. Exactly. Awful, awful so he, human he, he wasn't even an economist. He was. Uh, I think wasn't he like a statistic, statistician. Or mathematician or something like that. So a lot of people, you know, like Safed and Moose are making just fun of him because he he uh, it it uh, the whole premise, you know, of of a fundament foundation of of Austrian economics is not really based in logic or rational or uh, you know ethos. So yeah. So why don't you just kick it off, Master, before I go on a rant? Um, why do you think, uh, first of all, uh, Hayek? I mean, when did he make those statements regarding Malthusian ideology? Uh, and did he stick to that, or was he always, you know, a Malthusian uh, sort of a advocate of population reduction? Uh, if I mean, if I'm interpreting correctly, um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, the particular quotes that I cite of von Hayek specifically, and, and yes, everything you've said about Keynes is, is correct, and it's so much worse even than than what you you've alluded to. Keynes is an absolute um, mathematician. He believed in the mathematization of all human systems, in not specifically because he believed in the sort of moral virtues that he professed in some of his works um on the surface but those were really just words the the idea of, especially when you look at his role as vice president of the eugenic society for uh many years he was a life a, a lifelong member is and and he also so not only was a eugenicist he was also a a, a very high top leader in the malthusian league the neo-malthusian league promoting uh, a system of mathema mathematical controls of global populations by a master class. He, as you said, was openly a pedophile who mathematically judged and graded every single one of his relations meticulously for for years and years with young boys. Um, very, very disgusting person. He was a rampant racist and uh, he was a Cambridge apostle. You know, I think that that's part of the, the key thing to look at with Keynes is that there are um, specific areas whereby if you should excel or find yourself a member of certain groups you know certain people i think everyone kind of knows of the skull and bones as sort of the yale-based secret society set up in the 1830s by these anglophile opium trading uh oligarchs in america who were always loyal to the british system of global management mm -hmm. these were the 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 operatives who were the heirs or the 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 the, the sources of today's deep state that oversaw the murder of uh, I would say about eight American presidents who died while in office over the course of the ensuing 200 years. So <clears throat> Keynes was, so people know of the skull and bones, but they don't know of the, the Cambridge of apostles, which is much higher up in the chain of command. And, and the, every year in Cambridge, there's always 12 apostles who are sort of the inner creme de la creme, as they say, who will go on to be the upper level managers of the system. So like Bertrand Russell was a Cambridge apostle, Alfred North Whitehead. Um, and now you're dealing not so much with the hands-on management, which is where, you know, if you think about it, like the the London School of Economics, the uh, Oxford, these are these are are perhaps at some some points in deep history, uh, Oxford might have produced some good people. But 
in my analysis, especially since the Rhodes Scholarship system was set up, the the Rhodes Scholars were processed in Oxford, just like Fabians are processed in the London School of Economics, to become more hands-on managers of the system. They get their hands a little bit more dirty as mercenaries of the church of this British empire. The, um, the Cambridge Apostles is more where the battle of ideas, the grand strategists are processed. That's where you get a little bit more intelligence um, and a lot more evil. So Keynes was a, was, was a, a product of that, of that processing system. Now, there was a uh, people have been told, and I'll get to the question of von Hayek um, this way, because I, I really want people to get the context of this dualism that was that that pretty much took over, especially during the, the Cold War, um, both political parties, whereas now today, or especially since John F. Kennedy was murdered, um, most Democrats in the, in the United States and most people on the so-called uh, left of the political spectrum had to increasingly see themselves as Keynesians. And those who were conservatives were expected to adopt um, an, you know, basically an Austrian school mode of thinking with, with either von, von Mises, von Hayek. Now, just to get clear, there are a lot of good people who are my friends who are, who are members of the Austrian school. We get, we get along okay, but this is my direct assessment as a historian looking at this battle of ideas. This is how I'm seeing we're being played. Um, the whole idea of either being on the right or on the left and thus being Keynesian or, a, or an Austrian school was a product of social engineering. And the, uh, the, New, the London Times was a conduit set up in 1932, as I go through in my article, that created and popularized right before Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in America, this is October 1932, a series of debates between the two schools, Keynes and von Hayek. The platform was the, Lon the London School of Economics, which was the school where von Hayek was also teaching. Uh, Keynes was was regularly giving lectures there, and that was sort of the the, the domain that this was amplified into the zeitgeist. Um, there are a lot of parallels, even though they seem different. There, Keynes and von Hayek were lifelong friends. That's the first thing to keep in mind. They were always lifelong friends. They were members of very similar organizations at, at different times. Um, there was an offshoot and an outgrowth of the Fabian Society set up. Um, called the Mont Pelerin Society after World War II. It was set up in 1947. Um, people like Karl Popper were founding members. So was von Hayek. Um, Karl, Karl Popper, for those who don't know, is the, uh, the, the, the teacher of George Soros. Um, it's a long list. I go through many of the founding members. But there's the differences are superficial. And the, the differences largely are one... Keynes promotes the idea that all systems, if you want to deal with it with an economic depression, let's say, which is what the cause of the or the, the, the driver of the 1932 debate was all about, is how do we solve the Great Depression? So they both had their own ideas. One was all based upon the idea that you need top down control. Um, the idea of personal liberty wasn't a consideration for the mathematician Keynes. It was all about top down control, uh, creating work, making work giving, so that people get paychecks. And it didn't really matter in the Keynesian system, if you were getting paid, getting government paychecks to, to uh, do something totally useless, like somebody could be paid to dig a hole and the other person next door could be paid to fill the same hole up, useless work, but, but they both get government paychecks. They will both then, Keen said, go spend it at the store. That creates a demand for products. You know, they, they have to buy groceries. Well, then the groceries are being made by farmers. The, the milk cartons are being made in, in factories. And so Keynes was saying, well, that will then create a demand for the factories and the farmers. And then that factory, the factory work especially, will then require a demand for electricity grids and, and water systems because factories require a lot of energy and water. And then that will then cause a demand for the government to then build infrastructure. So it was this weird, um, strange system. Von Hayek, on the other hand, basically made the point that no, um, you need to simply encourage people to uh, have personal liberty and, you know, they'll, they'll spend as they see fit. But, you know, just the idea of government intervention, government involvement in the economy was seen as co-equal to tyranny. So whether you had an Abraham Lincoln or a John F. Kennedy or a Franklin Roosevelt or a Hitler, 
it was all they all used the government to do things in the economic sphere and thus they were all equally tyrannical because all roads would lead ultimately to pure fascist tyranny if you allowed the government to do that so he had a, a separation between the individual and the government with this assumption that that will always lead you if you permit the government to have a role to play to fascism and tyranny so there are a lot of there are a lot of points of similarity that i go through in my article um that both negated the reality that there was such a thing as the American national national system of political economy that was neither uh, that couldn't be fit into either school. It's not socialist. It's not communist. It's not free market capitalist. But when you look at those eight eight American presidents who died while in office, and you look at what they're doing, they're doing something which which is neither neither one of those extremes. And the empire works by extremes. Now you asked me about uh, Malthus, the place that I had noticed uh, first and foremost von hayek speaking about population control was in a 1981 interview this is towards the end of his life he had already won the nobel prize in the 70s um in business week november, november the 11th 1981 and that's his um uh, it's a bit of an infamous infamous quote mm -hmm. um i'm not going to quote Keynes's remarks on overpopulation and depopulation because yeah, they're powerful <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just but this is lesser known because it and in some places in his writings, he acts like he's not he's not for population control because that is infringing on the personal liberty of people and the personal choice, which is like sacred. Um, but then in other places, there's not a consistency. This is towards the end of his life. And he says, over the next 20 years, the world population, I'm quoting him, is expected to double again. For a world that is founded on egalitarian ideas, the problem of overpopulation is unsolvable. If we guarantee that everyone who is born will be supported we will soon no longer be able to fulfill that promise since growth will outstrip resources. There is only one break for overpopulation, namely that the only ones who may survive and procreate are those who can support themselves. So the only people who you say are, are in a position where they're um, economically fit at, at the current moment, in, in, independent of the amount of injustice, you know, you're not looking at the the role of the the IMF, the World Bank, to consciously keep people at a state of intrinsic poverty and, and economic insecurity. The point that he's coming at is that if you are not, if you are economically fit to sustain your family, you may procreate. If you're not, you may not procreate. If you're just, um, and let's sort of that's the idea of the Herbert Spencer social Darwinism, you know, in opposition to the the Galton Francis Galton idea. So you had this whole debate about. A century before that that quote between two different um british imperial thinkers who were both taking darwin's theory of evolution which is not really a true scientific theory at all yeah especially the idea of the survival of the fittest and and having a false debate over how to apply it to human systems where herbert spencer who coined the term social darwinism took a liberal approach saying no if we just let everything be and let let the competition go the unfit will be destroyed by the fit and you will have just a, a, a natural ordering like darwin says occurs in nature with no regulation and then you know darwin's cousin uh galton said no 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 you need strong government top-down controls to manage this the science of global uh purification of the gene pool so people were debating and saying, oh, I'm going to be on that side or that side. No, the whole thing was wrong. It was all based on the same underlying core assumptions. The, the last, and I think the most disgusting thing from Hayek's remarks is that the, the last page, a lot of, there's a lot of nice things in his road to serfdom that I, that I agree with. But then there's a lot of things that are these weird Trojan horses. At the, at the last chapter, he says, and I quote, on world government, there must be a power which can restrain the different nations from acting harmful to their neighbors, a set of rules which defines what a state may do, and an authority capable of enforcing these rules onto states. The powers which such an authority would need are mainly of a negative kind. It must, ab above all, be able to say no to all sorts of restrictive measures. So he's essentially calling for a supranational power that has an enforcement capability that is capable of enforcing rules in case anybody breaks away from the global system of free markets that he demands must be imposed onto this rules-based order this is actually the, the heart of the rules-based international order 
this is he's already writing this in in, in 19 I think it's 44 that the road to serfdom is written that's that's right there should cause everybody who says all but he said all of these nice things here and here and here and here. well this is he's in his prime intellectual prime and he's writing that uh, I, mean, I think just uh, a yeah. quick question. I mean, are you, uh, is that the, the quote? I mean, it's, it sounds like uh, he's also advocating for eugenics. I mean, for not, you know, not procreating, uh, you know, the, in the, within the context of not, <laughs> is that, well, was he advocating? He doesn't go with, I think he's taking more the Herbert Spencer line, which is why the Her Herbert Spencer is seen even today by many intellectual libertarians as a, as a, um, uh, a bit of a hero in the intellectual community. But I, I don't think he's necessarily he wouldn't go so far as to call himself a eugenicist the way somebody like a Keynes would, because he's of the view that, no, everything should just be hands off and the weak will be weeded out naturally. We don't have to have social engineers organizing and enforcing negative eugenics onto those who are unfit. It'll just naturally happen as the strong, you know, corporations, the strong, the strong will be able to to defeat the weak and, and create powerful monopolies or whatever whatever they might do because that's what happens when you actually like um, deregulate a banking system or corporations they will naturally play dirty <laughs> they won't they won't just play by honest rules of competition they never do right. and and they will then do what they've done to ireland by depopulating ireland by under the guise of free markets you know or india by you know they will they, they will destroy indian textiles and destroy indian population under the guise of free markets, which is what the British East India Company did for 200 plus years, or China, or today's Africa, you know, pumping opium down Chinese throats. As as an, I, the idea was never to make money off of opium. C certainly, many people did do that, but the intention was always to destroy the the creative and, and moral vitality of the Chinese people to subdue the dragon and keep them under the heel of the British Empire. And they'll use. They can't just say they want to do that, so they have to use an intellectual veneer of competition market laws you know and and if the chinese go and say no we don't want opium into our land we're going to block it with restrictions well that 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 means you know casus belli act of war and we'll bring gunboats to enforce the the rules of free markets onto you mm -hmm. um and, and and so that's the thing i mean it's i i think that hayek would would identify more with that type of loose hands off. But in reality, when you look at, well, what does he work for? What is the Austrian school? Why do we even call it to be a good American? You have to be a good Austrian. Well, what is the, what was the Austrian school? Why do we even call it that? Well, the Austrian school, I mean, itself came out of the, uh, the, the Habsburg dynasty, you know, these inner families, the Habsburgs, the Saxe Goethe's, the, uh, the, 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 the Thun and Taxis uh, families, the, the, today we call them the Windsors, but it's the, the Saxe Kerbergs. They're they're all part of the same oligarchical inbred hive that they have different that and if they've had different jurisdictions in different parts of Europe or you know other places, but primarily it's concentrated in Europe. These are the these are the heirs of the old Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire, especially that collapsed. And they will work together and then sometimes they will compete and backstab each other, but they generally will commonly work to on on things that they can all agree have to be done. Number one. Keep people in a state mentally of of talking cattle, depopulated, fighting each other. That they can all agree on. They 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 ultimately will fight for territory. So the Austrian school had you know, in the in the nineteenth century, innovated. Uh, the 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 Austrian population and a lot of German speaking uh, people were not so ready to accept. They didn't have British liberalism as part of their culture. It was it's not the elites, not the people. The British Brit, Britain did have a liberalism. So Adam Smith was able to, and John Stuart Mill, David Ricardo, David Say, um, uh, Jeremy Bentham, Malthus. These were all British liberal um, thinkers. That that was able to take hold very much within the British aristocracy and general culture, but it it wasn't taking off anywhere else. But it was very effective at keeping nations subdued under you know a sci a, a scientific veneer so the austrian management under the habsburgs were i mean this was an evil evil empire this is what created the jesuits right like the habsburg empire domination of the of rome in the in the 1530s was the 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 period that you had the institution of this mercenary secret society sect uh, called the jesuits to both be an arm for the most radical 
feudal branch of the Catholic Church, but also to keep the Catholic Church, the papacy, and, and some cardinals in a line if they chose to develop their morality and work against the wishes of the feudalists. So it both worked to keep the, the, the papacy in check, but also at different times to enforce the most destructive very uh, variants of, of uh, Catholic, what, what effectively became Catholic fascism of the, the Mussolini variety later on. So the Habsburgs were like, how do we bring this, this, this great system of, of, of manipulation and management into our world? So they had to basically repackage and re rebrand what was Adam Smith and British liberalism under a new name, a new rebranding. And, and they called it the Austrian school. And it, you had people like Karl Menger, who was yeah, one that's of the- what I was going to talk about because your article focuses on Hayek, of course. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I'm not an Austrian uh, economy scholar or anything, but the, the, the books and the articles I read, and, you know, because I'm in the Bitcoin community, it's all about, you know, it was always, there's always, you know, <laughs> you, uh, bringing up uh, Menger, you know, and Mises and, and then Rothbard much later. Now, the rational economists or rational thinkers, among, I mean, uh, they usually do not, I mean, I don't have the, the impression or the perception that they, you know, are like a huge fan or advocate or, uh, you know, or quoting so much of, of Hayek, more more like Hoppe, you know, Hoppe, like, uh, what is it called? The, the God that failed, what's it called? The God that failed or dem democracy that failed or something like that, where it's like totally anti-state, anti-government. And and just for our listeners and viewers, I mean, the, the fundamental, uh, you know, uh, principles of Austrian economics is like bringing back, you know, sound money, uh, efficient allocation of capital, um, um, uh, you know, uh, and and then you know just just getting rid of all this, uh, eliminating all this, all this, you know, the, the current you know monetary policies that we have that is based, you know, on on Keynesianism or MMT, uh, on you know printing money out of nothing. Uh, so every like fundamentally, it's everything opposite. Like bringing back, you know, some would it be like gold or Bitcoin in this case, and um, and you know, and uh, reintroducing the the efficient allocation of capital, efficiency, technological innovation. You know, like La Belle Epoque. You know, we hear also about La Belle Epoque. You know, under the gold standard, where there were a lot of original, you know, technological innovation. You know, where there was still sound money and not the central banking system, especially since 1930 of the Federal Reserve. Uh, so. I mean, do you want to elaborate a little bit uh, with a caveat or with a <laughs> reservation? Like, what, do you, I mean, are you in favor or do you, do you know anything about like Austin economics, what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to teach or to bring back, you know, like sound uh, principles, sound monetary principles? Well, that's why I'm saying like, yeah, I get along. Like a lot of my friends are Austrian school uh, people, you know, Tom Luongo is a good friend of mine. Um the thing that I that I like about them is this love of liberty and this idea, exactly as you pointed out, the need for sound money that's tied to real value and freedom at the same time. Um, that's good, and we can we can all agree with that. Also, people who are like not ideological about like all of the axioms, because I'm I myself see like I if you ask me what do I identify myself as, um, I the closest thing I could come to would be something like a moral pragmatist. You know, I, I, I look for things that work to solve problems of not just a material, but also spiritual, intellectual uh, di dimension within human society. So I, I look see. for- As a more holistic that, with uh, a ethos, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of what- and I will find in different thought matrices, which usually have certain assumptions, whether, you know, if you're a communist and I have friends who are Marxists and we get along because we agree on certain uh, moral principles. Like we believe that you should increase the productive powers of labor to leap over the limits to growth, um, which is the opposite of what a like like a, a Keynesian or a Malthusian says. No, you should always be an animal adapting to your limits under a system of management. So, but then you also have Marxists who, who think that way too. So, you know, nothing is so clean cut. Um, so I look for people who have moral values and will try to find the best in the thing that they, that they have been influenced by to solve problems. And usually you can get people from the left, from the right to work together on common uh, principled things like that. Um, so even today, you know, like there's the, the, there's movements coalescing that involve people like Jill Stein 
from the the Green Party and people like Caleb Malpoint, who's a a, a devoted Marxist, but a, but they're both good people. I disagree ideologically with the, the the things that are influencing both of them, but they're both two very good people who really don't want World War Three, and they really want to win the United States back from the deep state. And so I can I can work with that. Like that's something I can recognize, and you can they can work together, and people. Uh, who think on those terms can do the same. So, um, and, and, you know, there, there's people who like Ron Paul, who is speaking at their events too, for, for peace. And Ron Paul is a great person. And so, and Rand Paul is a courageous person, even though they're libertarians and I don't agree with everything that, that they believe in about the nature of, of government. But despite that, they, then they're working with Jill Stein and they're working with Caleb Alpine. They're, they're giving speeches, or at least Ron Paul was giving speeches at their events. So, um, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we have been, I think, stripped of the right to understand the principled battle between oligarchical systems and what one might call, um, I, I really like the theories of uh, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, um, who started off originally as a Marxist. He's often called a libertarian by his enemies or detractors. Um, he's also called a, a you know, an anti-Semitic fascist because he's talked about the, 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 you know, George Soros and the Rothschild. So obviously that means you're an anti-Semitic fascist. Um, he recently passed away in 2019. And so it was by my studies of his work and, and I became a volunteer with his organization about, uh, what are we dealing with here? 15 years ago, I, I, I parted ways with the organization about five years ago. But uh, during that time, it was a very enriching intellectual experience where I, I first encountered the idea that there was such a thing as the American system of political economy. Um, I had known of the, the writings of Friedrich List, a German economist who did a lot to unite Germany for the first time as a sovereign nation state around the Zollverein, the, the customs union. But I didn't know much more than that. But then in doing the research around the LaRouche organization, their researchers, and, and digging up a lot of the firsthand material, I began to realize, no, the reason why Friedrich List was able to do what he did with the what he coined as the national system of political economy was because he studied for five years in America. He lived for in the United States between 1824 and 1829, studying how the American system of constitutional banking functioned after the War of Independence and especially the, the Constitutional Convention. And so he looked at how, how, how did the miracle of America's early survival occur when after the, after the War of Independence, the 13 states were irreparably bankrupt. There was hardly any manufacturing. There was very little infrastructure of, of meaning. Um, the states had protectionism between each other, so they couldn't even unify. They couldn't collect taxes. They couldn't, there was no real, there's two banks. Um, that's all. Everybody else was just, I mean, there, there's, there was no real coherence and they were fighting each other. And it was only a matter of time before the British empire regained control of their lost belligerent colony. And so, but they, they didn't, it didn't work out that way. They ended up quadrupling their population within 40 years. Um, they ended up out, out producing Britain in almost everything by 18, uh, by the 1850s. And so Frederick, list this was this process was already moving in a very interesting way breaking all the rules of what you would think would be possible and uh, and they paid off all their debts by uh, the 1800s early 1800s um like 1802 they had paid off their debts they were able to buy louisiana from napoleon um you know like all of this stuff was going on so frederick list was studying how did how is this possible and so he recognized that you had this this thing called hamiltonian economics, which itself came from the study of, of Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin's work on paper currencies, on Ben Franklin's um, necessity on the increase of mankind in 1851, and the earlier um, school of, of, of France, especially the what's called the dirigist school of Jean-Baptiste Colbert and Cardinal Jules Mazarin. Colbert was the, the finance minister of France. And so a lot of these founding fathers especially Hamilton was, and also uh, John Jay, were uh, studying Colbertism and how France was able to develop in such a miraculously powerful way, especially after the, the, the Peace of Westphalia and building canals, uh, making sure that the credit of the nation, the, the, the money went not just into war profiteering, 
but with the peace process that was made possible by the establishment of the sovereign nation state system itself in eight in 1648 that was called the peace of westphalia in organized by by mazarin primarily the the eminence grise of france they were able to put an end to this ongoing religious warfare that had been plaguing europe for centuries um, it wasn't just 30 years. It was long before that. And, and all sides, Protestant killing Catholic, were all getting funded by the same um, financiers, the same London, Venetian. <laughs> huh? Yeah, same, <laughs> yeah, we've seen this before. <laughs> it, it works. <laughs> and so the the with the peace process that occurred thereafter, based upon the recognition of the sovereign nation state for the first time, and also the idea of the benefit of the other, that my identity will be based upon my power to benefit my neighbor instead of going to war with them to steal their 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 stuff. Um, you you could finally have the treasuries, the 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 money in the treasury move towards not funding wars, but now funding canals like the Midi Canal. That was the biggest canal of of, of in world history built up under under Colbert, which up upshifted the quality of the education of the people, the workforce. It created a, a, a driver, a new set of demands because new industries were created to build this canal. And it was partially private. It was public-private. It was a private company with a private engineer who had a great idea. He he was able to sell it to the, the king because, you know, they basically took orders, like who could get the job done in the most efficient way. This guy did a good, he had a good pitch and he was brilliant and it worked and it had like lifts and locks and dams. Like there's so many things going on in there. And um, and it was a real miracle in terms of the ability to increase the longevity of the people of France, but also surrounding adjacent regions in Germany, in well then Prussia. It created a basis of of trust where there was none before, um, and it create also increased the population in ways that the Malthusians despised. So of course the American founding fathers, many of the best ones, were all studying how did this work in in the past. There there were. And how can we 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 do this in the context that we need to do it, which is what was done when Hamilton came up with the idea of consolidating the debts of the of the thirteen states after after the War of Independence into a new a new debt, but now with a new character where the this new debt was tied to credit that would then be issued through national banks with branches in each of the states that would then give loans to entrepreneurs to to people who had great ideas to build things, and it was all tied to internal improvements. And you would unify the nation that way. You'd you'd have an ability to 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 um to coordinate action amongst the whole nation and create an, a new an identity that would be able to then defend against the onslaught of the city of London, the the global command center of evil, in my view, and the things like the British East India Company that were always consciously doing battle to, to destroy and undermine the Young Republic. So you need a nation state for that reason. That's why empires want to get rid of nation states and create world government. So Frederick List was studying that, and that's what he brought to Germany to to unify the 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 the, the warring baronial states of Germany, and where you had little princelings of the from the the old days of the, of the Holy Roman Empire, empire, where you had like two thousand little zones of jurisdiction of little mercenaries with their little mini armies and their little mini forms of credit. There was fighting each other for scraps of land that was still a problem of germany in the 19th century so friedrich list was able to finally organize like hell this guy was a master organizer and he he came up with the idea in the 1840s of the zolverein of the the idea of doing what america did after the war and create a protective tariff around a, a communion of co uh, adjacent states that would then internally emit credit through a, a type of state banking system for the investments into the canals, the, the railroads were a big one that would then justify the qualitative increase of the 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 economy in, in a full spectrum way. And you'd be able to finally build industries that you had no industries before that. Everyone was stuck on agrarianism. And all of a sudden you had an impetus to have now industries now emerge that gave people more economic independence. Um and the empire local had local governments, was he like sort of an advocate of local, like regional or local? It's you know, a balance. Centralized governance or, or it's a balance of both. Like the idea is the people are the government. So it's a different philosophy. Like philosophically, it's like every every individual for a sovereign nation to work has to look in the mirror and see themselves as an active uh the, as the government. And and for that to work, I have to take responsibility and be an active participant, not just voting every few years, but actively participating in the in town hall meetings in participating and holding my representatives accountable things like that 
So it's a different philosophy. You can't be disengaged in that sense culturally um, for that system to, to be viable. If people then detach, then you get a tyrannical system. Then the government will always be usurped because it's a great power and great power can do great evil or great good. And if people all disengage, yeah, guaranteed, <laughs> it's only a matter of when those oligarchs will then use the, those power structures to then crush the people and use whatever they want in the nation to crush other nations for their benefit. Like the U.S. has been been assigned to play that role since World War II, crushing Africa, crushing small nations that want to develop. That's the power of the U.S. government economically, militarily has been usurped by those who killed JFK. They killed Franklin Roosevelt. They killed Lincoln. They killed McKinley. They killed Harding. They killed you know Garfield. They killed... Uh, uh, Zachary Taylor, they killed William Harrison, like all of these American presidents. Um, who all I died. find it pretty interesting that because most people, I mean, I didn't, I, to be honest, I, I I heard that from you from the first time, you know, I didn't know that I thought, you know, maybe it was JFK and maybe Lincoln, but most people like myself, right, we, we, we don't, or we didn't know that there were so many presidents assassinated or at least assassination attempts, right? Oh, fuck. Yeah, man. No, I mean, it's sort of the language, but yeah, it surprised me too, because I'm a Canadian. So we don't learn any, we don't learn about any of this stuff in Canadian history. Like that's not, it's not, I had to, you know, try to really search this out to, cause I, my, my paradox was if the U S is the global empire, as I, as everyone seems to believe and, and, uh, and they certainly give us a lot of evidence to justify that belief. Um, why is it that the American people are suffering? America has created a world that is a lot less stable. Their security is a lot less insured. They're on the verge of an economic collapse. That's all visible, clear. Um, and their their leaders tend to get shut. And at first I thought it was just like Lincoln and JFK. And then you start digging at it and you're like, wait a minute. No, Franklin Roosevelt also died really fast while he was still president. Um, and then you're like, wait a minute. Warren Harding, who was also trying to revive a Lincoln policy and was fighting against the League of Nations, the, the first attempt in the 20th century at a one world government. Well, Warren Harding was also he died really fast too from like, they didn't even do an autopsy. It's we're told it's oyster poisoning. Um, and you're like, what about Garfield? seems like he had a whole program. He was a Lincoln Republican in 1860 or 1880 as president who fought in the civil war and had a whole program to take the U S military and declare war on Britain. He was killed. Okay, so um, substantial evidence was there always the like background motive. <laughs> yeah. Motive is consistently clear. And McKinley, same thing. McKinley had a whole like revival of the protective tariff that, you know, the nation had to use a protective tariff to defend the, uh, the, 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 the manufacturers and the, the agriculturers from cheap dumping of goods by the British East India Company or other, other foreign operations. So you want to cultivate your local industry to, to stand on your own two feet. He was killed and he had a whole plan for South America as well to help facilitate South American nations to have access to um, to uh, industries, to rail. He had a whole plan to connect the uh, the Dorian Gap from Central to South America by rail, as well as the you know so many things. And so he got killed in 1901. And but but there's people even before Lincoln, and you're like they're all doing the same thing. It's all of them, and even like Harrison, um, William Harrison. The see be before it was the Whig Party, it was like all of the 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 leading players in America who were like the best, most solid intellectual fighters against evil were primarily in the around the 1820s 30s centering themselves around what's called the Whig party John Quincy Adams Lincoln before the Republican party was created then at a certain point the Whig party became too corrupted and they had the best of them had to break away and create the Republican party which they did in 1856 um as an anti-slave party right like originally it was the, it was the Democratic Party that was understood to be the party of the slave and the slave power in Wall Street. Um, but so Warren, uh, William Harrison had in eight, he died in after three months in office. But on his desk, you had legislation to revive the Third National Bank that had been killed earlier by um, Andrew Jackson in 1836. And in 1840, there was a plan to revive it because when the when the bank that bank was killed, and yeah, I know we're told that was the precursor to the, to the Federal Reserve. I know that's the story. I know we're told that Hamilton was a Rothschild stooge. I know we're told that that stuff. I can guarantee you it's all a lie. That's that's a mythology that was created over two centuries ago, and it's never been true. 
the Federal Reserve is a takeover. The Hamilton National Bank is not a Federal Reserve Bank. Jackson was an asset of Aaron Burr. His house, the Jackson Mansion, was used as the headquarters for Burr's third attempt to break up the union in 1807 when you had a whistleblower who blew the whistle to Congress, to Jefferson, and said, by the way, you have a conspiracy to kill you, Jefferson. Declare war against Spain with Burr at the head of a new empire being set up for the called the Western Confederacy that would then take control of Louisiana and, and New Orleans. This, this, I think he was a senator. He blew the whistle. They had congressional hearings. The headquarter was Andrew Jackson's house that Aaron Burr had selected to be the basing of operations to work with the British and then take control of the North and then undo the American Constitution. That was the whole thing. And join up with Canada. Um, and the, the slave power of the South, we're going we're gonna to have their own, their own new country too with their own new constitution. It took another 50 years after that failed to revive the plan in the form of the, the Civil War, but that's what was done. So when Burr left, he, avoid, he basically made his way. He was so hated in America that he had to escape to go to Britain via Canada where Burr lived for five years at Jeremy Bentham's house, the head of British intelligence. He lived at his house doing opium and prostitutes for five friggin' years. And he writes a journal, a, a, a dedicated, devoted journal of his, of his heinous hedonistic exploits with Jeremy Bentham. And, um, and then comes back right weeks before the war of 1812 against Britain is launched and starts rebuilding his political machine of Tammany Hall. That, he's the guy who created and ran Tammany Hall. He's the guy who also founded the Bank of Manhattan or took used the Bank of Manhattan to create the basis for Wall Street. That's that's Aaron Burr. So Burr Burr is the first guy to start bringing Jackson as the War of 1812 war hero into political play, which he op his letters are there for anybody to read of him saying Jackson will be the person who we make president in 1815 in order to do what he was not able to do, which is destroy Alexander Hamilton, who he'd already killed, but make, destroy now Hamilton's baby. I mean, I'm not talking about Philip Hamilton, who he also killed. Ha two years before he killed Hamilton, he killed Hamilton's child through a, another duel, which is why Hamilton and Burr used the exact same guns on the exact same spot, where two years earlier, Hamilton's son, Philip, had been killed by one of Burr's um, disciples on the same spot in New Jersey. With the same guns like that's there's there's a story there i don't i don't fully understand all the details but there that speaks loudly but he had to kill the national bank of hamilton which they did by corrupting it from within they installed you know the the van buren um van buren was also a personal lawyer for aaron burr too he's part of the burr machine with with jackson both became president and uh and and you know van buren's people quickly infested the bank they took over uh, the control of the national bank to run it into, uh, to misuse it. And it gave people a good reason to feel burned by it. But as soon as they then killed the national bank under Jackson, America went into a bank panic, open speculation, open free markets reigned supreme. And all of the national projects like the Erie canal, all the rail projects that were being built up in the 1820s and thirties, everything stopped. It's like the IMF telling uh, Greece that you're not allowed to spend your national capital on, in, you know, you want to build a, a sewage system? No, you have to pay your debt. Paying the debt became the only thing that anybody valued. And of course, what happens to Greece? Well, the people suffer. They 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 die sooner. You know, all of these things. So the social fabric breaks down, and the nation became becomes more owned. You know, you privatize your state assets in order to get money to pay your debt, and that's the way the IMF and the World Bank have colonized the world in the since World War II. It's that technique, and that's what Especially was done. Africa, by because you know Greece is just one example. I mean, the, the ex, ex post uh, ex post colonial, you know, uh, powers to be whether it be France or like you know, most people I, I didn't know. You know, I think it was Alex Gladstein who who wrote now you know a book or actually several articles in a book about the. Uh, the colonization, ex post colonization of Africa, where like 14, 15 African states are still actually colonized by the, what do you call it? The, the CFR, CFR Franc, something like that, uh, uh, where yeah. they're still, you know, uh, being, uh, to totally dependent on uh, and, and, and exploited by the, by the, uh, by the French colonial powers, actually. Uh, yep. But yeah, but because you were talking about, you know, you mentioned you're talking about IMF and the World Bank. I mean, these are the, like the biggest criminal organizations on, on, on this planet that have been like systematically exploiting 
Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. like you said, South Africa, the, the, the French banks issue the coin for, like, yeah, exactly. like you just said, 14, yeah. 15 countries. Um, economically, they've never been permitted to, to stand up on their own two feet. And every time they come close, their leader who tries to do that, whether it's Thomas Sankara or Kwame Nkrumah or, or Patrice Lumumba, or there's, there's a Haile Selassie, um, they're, they're, they're either overthrown in a coup d'etat, they're assassinated, and the, the nation is then subjected to shock therapy to punish them for the belligerence of their, of their effort to have real freedom. Um, and so, yeah, that, this goes back a long ways. This is not an, it's, it's, it has a new 20th century sort of smell to it, but it's, it's the same old technique that was done again and again. So this was done in America to itself by these agents who were always, um, and I, I make the case in my book series, as well as in that article, but especially in my book series, that this, that the, the, the thing called the deep state, the, the council on foreign relations, the, 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 the worst elements of the, the pilgrim society um, in America, the, the skull and bones operation, um, earlier on, or even Wall Street itself was set up as a fifth column devoted to the orders of an agency across the ocean representing these old ancient bloodlines of the black nobility that always just want to restore global feudalism under um, and undo things like the, the Renaissance. They want to just undo the Renaissance. They want to go back in time to some imaginary state where things were somehow perfect when everybody was happy being a little underdeveloped, you know, peasant eating bugs with no property. That's what they've always wanted. It's not a new thing. It's, it's always been there as a desire. And the League of Nations was a big part of that originally um, in the 20th century after World War I, right? So, I mean, as far as like whatever type of, of credit um, takes away their power, whatever form or, or principled system removes the influence of the oligarchical parasite, I will support. <laughs> and to the degree that people can come up with models of uh, Bitcoin um, that will do that, I will support that. To the degree that there's models of Bitcoin that are subject to speculation and other forms of instability, I will not support that because I don't see what it's not all not all Bitcoin is equal. Right. And I think everyone knows that not all, not all protectionism is, is equal. Sometimes protectionism can be done to the detriment of the nation that's doing the protectionism. That'll happen. So you're not, oh, I'm not always for protectionism. It has to be done with the explicit intent to develop the powers, the productive powers and the freedom of the people. If it's not, mm -mm -mm -mm, that's bad. It's like Canada. We have protectionism under the British Empire between each of the provinces of Canada. The provinces don't enjoy free trade amongst each other, even though we call ourselves a sovereign nation. So it's actually... <laughs> What kind of nation can you have where you're fighting over each other and you're 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 paying more for Quebec hydro if you if you're a businessman if you're a business in Ontario trying to import hydroelectricity from Quebec than somebody in New York would be paying would be paying something like seventy percent less than what you would be paying to your fellow Canadians. It's not a, it's not d designed with the intention of developing a nation. It's not the intention is to keep the nation divided, underdeveloped, and used as a weapon against the American Republic, which unfortunately is too much of the case of Canada's entire identity in our history as a geopolitical chess piece on the grand chessboard. It's not a good protectionism. Yeah. You know? Maybe can we uh, just, just uh, at this moment, I mean, um, you know, I mean, Canada, when, when there's a, you know, nice, uh, there's a video of, of Trudeau, for example, you know, taking the oath and he's taking the oath to the Privy Council, right? I mean, maybe you can elaborate on like, who is, whose allegiance are you guys I mean, or, or not you, but the prime ministers or the, you know, the state officials are, are, what kind of allegiance are you giving? I mean, are you giving it to the crown? Uh, right? Yeah. 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 It's disgusting, eh? Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. pretty bad, yeah. Yeah. He's, every every uh, prime minister has to be inducted into the Privy Council. And as you're me made a member of Privy Council, you have to give an oath of allegiance to both uh, his majesty in this case and uh, the heirs of the crown into perpetuity. Um, and that you have to now abide by oaths of secrecy, right? You'll keep secret all things that ought to be kept secret in Privy Council, um, as a good servant must, says Justin Trudeau in his on his oath. Um, if you're a, if you're an immigrant coming to Canada, you have to pledge allegiance to the crown, you know, um, as an entity. It's a supranational entity, and it 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 people think of it as being just symbolic, but it is not symbolic. It has a real power, and it has a real 
machinery around it that people don't appreciate in terms of the control of of crown corporations, crown lands. The crown is the world's biggest landowner in the world by a huge margin. Um, something like 89% of the land in Canada is crown land, right? Wow. Like And international and globally? Uh, no, I, ta I talked about Canada. Okay. Globally, it's, okay. it's still like... Substance. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the person who's the second biggest landholder behind the crown is like, it's a far second. Like... Like wow. we're talking here, like a fraction of a fraction. So, um, and then, then you have crown estates, you know, like something like uh, most of the seabed all around uh, the island of Great Britain is all owned by the crown directly, all of the the land, the castles, but also then you have the Habsburg. So a lot of the, even though the Hab Habsburg em empire um, dissolved after World War One in the, in the Treaty of Versailles as an empire, the the same families, the Otto, Otto von Habsburg, and a lot of the leading families um, that did so much evil, overseeing the Inquisition, um, doing so much rapaciousness around the world. Still, they're still dominant families with with all of their territorial possessions, their castles, their trusts, their fondies, and uh, and this is the thing. Like so, here this gets back to the question of von Hayek and, and Keynes. So, the way this game was played, the way I could see it, after after McKinley was killed. In 1901, you had the takeover of this Anglo-American parasite in America under the form of Theodore Roosevelt, who created the first real Anglo-American special relationship. And he also oversaw the creation of the FBI, America's first secret police agency. Warren Harding was another eugenicist. Both of them were eugenicists, Theodore Roosevelt and, and Warren Harding, who, who gave vast support to uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, to uh, all of these eugenics cults that were also in the midst of, of funding this across Europe to the pseudoscience of defining how, to, how do you purify the human gene pool and sterilize the unfit using mathematical statistical analysis. This is why Keynes fit in really well with that. It's all about statistics, right? This um, is the fundamental difference. I think this is important because between Austrian economics, it's more about human action and this and the, the difference you know, to, to the comparison to the esoteric pseudoscience of Keynesian or MMT, because they all want to calculate, I mean, economics, which is, you know, just, just merely impossible, right? I mean, I think this is the, a good point just to emphasize that. Yeah, I mean, both of them, they take, they're, they're both, like, MMT and Keynes are, like, you, you're correct to note that they're almost the same thing. Um, MMT, modern monetary theory, is a complete fraud, and um, and it is like just sort of a retooled Keynesianism. Um, but the way I, I tend to look at it from the standpoint, I, I, I approach things always from the standpoint of of history first, the battles over historical dynamics, and then I, I sort of use that as a context in which to to analyze what sort of economic structure is being fought for, what type of idea of value within the monetary system is is being fought for. But my, my thing is I first look at the battles, the assassinations, the the policies to end the, the oligarchy, those things first. And uh, and so one of the things I, I can know is not only was McKinley killed and not only, not only was this eugenic structure um, amplified in America against the wishes and of of the true American patriots, but World War One was also artificially caused. It was it was not a natural occurring war. It was artificially caused, and it was caused by the targeted assassination of certain people, especially Archduke Ferdinand. But also there were others. Like there, you had like twenty different assassinations in the twenty years outside of Russia, in Germany, in France, from the eighteen eighties all the way up, really from the eighteen eighties to nineteen fourteen. I said 20. It's, it's a lot more than 20 assassinations, really. Presidents like Sadi Carnot, the president of France, uh, was assassinated in 19, 1895. And my God, the it's a huge list. Uh, two czars. And uh, my, it, it's, it, I, I, you, could, you could spend a lot of time making a list of, of great leaders. But again, like, like in the case of the American presidents, you tend to find that these were people who were obstructing the, the design to create an all-out a uh, new seven years war because the, the seven years war was sort of the first world war of Europe. There was an, always an effort to, to do that again. And so, but the problem was these pesky asshole humans with political power were often creating alliances, creating peace, peace treaties, trying to work together to create win-win environments against those who want to start fires. So they had to be killed. And that was done. That was the age of assassinations in my mind. 
So that led up to World War I. Coming out of World War I, the solution was world government, right? That's the obvious solution because the idea was, well, nation states, we tolerated the existence of nation states and, and nation states caused the war. So if you don't want war, just get rid of nation states and, and give your sovereignty over to a supranational body called the League of Nations. And then that could you know, give us all security and, and stability and all these good things. Now, most people didn't want that. A lot of people did, but a lot of people didn't. And it was really rejected in America. Uh, the United States nationalists under the link, the Lincoln nationalists came back to power around the figure I mentioned earlier, Warren Harding and Warren Harding refused to, to go along with giving up your military to the supranational entity or your, your economic powers. And he, he continued to make bilateral treaties with China, with Hungary, with Germany, with Russia outside of the League of Nations. So the League of Nations was demonstrating that they were actually more impotent they, if they couldn't enforce these sorts of things. Um, and he was doing a damn good job of it too. He was also bringing back protectionism to America um, and really pushing back against the eugenics overhaul of our, of our different states that was already underway. 30 U.S. states were already practicing eugenics by 1930, um, like racial ster sterilization based on statistics. So he had to be killed. He was he was eliminated. Um, but there were two approaches to uh, bringing, sort of pulverizing the spirit of the Europeans. One was in the form of the, well, the Versailles Treaty was a conscious, deliberate attempt to completely annihilate the German, the defeated German economy, right? Um, and the broader Austro-Hungarian empire that was dissolved. So in the case of Weimar, you had this approach, which was let's just print money to pay the debts that we are will never be able to pay. Because at the same time as you're trying to print the money, you you can't even produce value because all of the your rail is being confiscated. Your the the rural region that produces so much uh, steel and coal is being confiscated by France and and Alsace and Lorraine uh, are all being and up uh, Silesia are all being captured you know and, and stolen from germany which are the most rich productive economic zones so they don't have the economic means of producing anything but they have printing presses so they're told let's print the money and of course what happens of course of course you're going to destroy your economy you're it's going to go hyperinflation you're going to wipe your ass with money so that's what happens but it was it was it was a there was a there was a another solution warren harding was part of a network and in 1922, you had what was known as the Rapallo Agreements. And the Rapallo Agreements were organized by Walter Rathenau, a, a leading follower of Friedrich List in Germany, who um, had his assistant, Kurt von Schleicher was his assistant. Kurt von Schleicher went on to become chancellor 10 years later. Rathenau organized with the new Russian government um, an, an annulment of the Versailles Treaty debt payments and an agreement that Germany and Russia would begin to work together on industrial progress and infrastructure and also military sharing agreements in 1922. And America, American diplomacy was supporting this. So this was, was creating an environment where the Friedrich List Society of Germany was coming back into play. And just like I made the point that Karl Menger was created in order to subvert and prevent the spread of the Friedrich List um, movement, people like Eugen During was a, a leading figure of this in Germany, who was also an enemy of Karl Marx. Um, they repackaged Adam Smith in the 1870s. And Karl Menger, who was the teacher of Frank Knight, John Chapman, von Hayek, von Mises, like Karl Menger is the key. Karl Menger founded this school and he was the, the retainer of the houses of Habsburg and Wittelbosch. He was the personal tutor of the, the, the heir to the, the Habsburg throne. It was the, these were courtiers, courtiers of the Habsburg Empire, to, who were rebranding Adam Smith in service of the the Habsburg Empire of the Austrian school. That's where that came from, in order to prevent the spread of Friedrich List and his followers, who are otherwise using a different idea of economics under what you know von Bismarck applied this for the, for the Zollverein and other things, and also for developing rail into Russia, and they were doing that also in Russia under Sergei Vita, the finance minister and transport minister of of Russia who brought this whole system into Russia and, and had to, wanted to unite it with China around rail development, protectionism, national credit. Um, a, a, it was a way of harmonizing personal 
property, personal entrepreneurship with uh, national welfare at the same time, not one or the other. You don't have to pick one extreme. And that's that was the fraud. So in the case of Walter Rathenhau in 1922, well, he was quickly assassinated by the organization Consul. This was an anarchist um, terrorist cell. All, all of these anarchist terrorist cells, by the way, just like we see ISIS today being used by intelligence agencies to destroy and undermine leaders or governments you don't like. Like right now, ISIS is predictably attacking Niger, predictably, um, in the form of Boko Haram. Well, that's because they're 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 always being funded, bankrolled, directed by the CIA and Pentagon. That's not a new thing. Back yeah. in the yeah, they've always been assets. Yeah. Yeah. The the terrorist movement was in the form of these anarcho terrorists mm -hmm. um that had their cells in Poland with the black hand. That was a black hand terrorist cell that killed um Archduke Ferdinand. In, in America, that was what killed McKinley, was a British directed um terrorist network under Emma Goldman who called for killing leaders to bring about a, a society of, of, of personal freedom of everybody. If you just got rid of the political leaders and got rid of the establishment of political systems, then you could have personal liberty everywhere. And that was the logic of these anarchists. There were, there were a lot of them were followers of Mikhail Bakunin and Prince Kropotkin, who were also high-level oligarchs, especially Kr Prince Kropotkin, who goes back to the, the House of Ruhr, the Rurik dynasty, and he saw himself as the heir to the, the Russian throne. Um, he, it was his operation in Russia that was working with Emma Goldman that launched the, the murder of Tsar Alexander II in 1880, the same month that uh, Garfield was also killed by one of these creatures in America. Um, Emma Goldman was in prison, and she was released from prison on bail by Bertrand Russell because both of them were members of the Neo-Malthusian League, and it was the same Neo-Malthusian League that, free, that Keynes ended up leading a few decades later. So you see how this whole thing is like organized by one center of command. I'm just saying that to, to paint that picture because Walter Rathenau, who organized the Rapallo Accords that would have made, eliminated the, the Versailles Treaty, it would have made hyperinflation in Germany impossible because it was all based on a revival of what works, um, building up industries, building up science technology, working for foreign policy uh, ententes. He was killed by the organization Consul. That then became, it changed its name after it was illegalized. They killed 300 other German leaders at that same time. 300 German leaders on a municipal, federal, and provincial level were all assassinated because they were all parts of the same Friedrich List Society movement by the organization Consul. So the Consul was, they changed their name and they became the paramilitary group of the new Nazi party that started as a fringe group, but was always being cultivated and, patron and, and funded by the, the same Wall Street, London bankers, the Morgans, the DuPonts, the, the the Rockefellers, the Standard Oil Machine, the Bank of England. That was always there making this fringe group become popular, become successful. So anyway, um, hyperinflation wasn't necessary. But but by killing Rathenau, and Schleicher then narrowly saved his life, and he became chancellor, but he was killed by Hitler later on. Um what happened was you had this false dichotomy of being told, well, as as people who have lost World War I, you have a choice. You could either print money, so the Weimar Republic did that, or or you can cut the budget and you can you can enforce massive budgetary restrictions on all state spending. And you can and so people who might need um, support because their their lives, you know, it's, it's post-war, right? Lives are wrecked. There's no jobs. Some people need some su state support. All of that has to stop to save money. Now, those are the two choices. We know what happened with Weimar Germany hyperinflation. We know the solution of that was what Kiel Marschacht introduced as far as trade in your billions of dollars of, of Reichsmarks and we'll give you a shiny new rent and mark and you can now spend it with these new constraints under, you know, the Nazi thing. Well, the Austrian government was also in 1919, the actual first fascist government was not Mussolini's Italy. It was actually Austria, was the first fascist government. And the economic advisor to the 1919 Austrian fascist government was Ludwig von Mises and his personal assistant, Friedrich von Hayek, both. They advised and shaped policy of massive austerity in uh, the face of the debt repayment demands. And they did that by by exactly what, again, the IMF and World Bank demand of poor countries like whatever the pigs nations, that, as they call them, of Portugal, you know, Spain, Greece, but also Africa and, and everything else. Cut the budget, austerity, pay your debts. Don't. So oftentimes, a lot of the followers of 
uh, von Hayek celebrate themselves for being so much better than the than the the Weimar crowd because they didn't print the money to pay the debt. They cut the budget to pay the debt. Just like Andrew Jackson says, I, I, I paid the debt. It's like, yeah, but your whole nation went into speculative hell on earth and you stopped building anything. You, 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 you're like, you went to fucking hell because you did that and you stopped investing in the future. So anyway, it's the sort of same logic. And then afterwards, you know, uh, Arthur Salter, who's uh, on the League of Nations Supreme Economic Council, is uh, in charge of Austria. The, he's working closely with von Mises and von Hayek the whole time pushing this thing. And then Mises also becomes uh, the advisor to Engelbert uh, Dolfus, who's the chancellor of Austria from 32 to 34, another fascist. Um, a different variety of fascists than Hitler. They, they had their own branding of fascism, but they both basically... And the thing about all of these characters is that they're all members of... For those who didn't like the League of Nations as a world government and they wanted to keep national sovereignty, there was an accommodation made for them. And it was called in 1922, as Rathenau was being killed, as... as Warren Harding was being killed. You had what's called the um, the um, um, oh Count Richard Kudenhova Kalergi creates Pan Europa, the Pan European movement. All of these members, from Engelbert Dolfus to Alter Sal Salter to um, um, uh, Schacht, Hjalmar Schacht the Nazi finance minister, they are all disciples and devoted members of exactly that, pan-Europeanism, the, the, the Kudenhova Kalergi pan-Europa. All of them are members because the idea is we can, we, we can say we don't like one world government, but what we'll do is we'll promote regional sovereignty. So we'll, we'll start promoting like a, a United States of Europe. Uh, we'll start promoting a European, like these different regions that can be then jurisdictions under fascist management, then beholden to receive orders and commands by the, the bankers that will be at the top of the food chain at the end of the day. So that was always the game. Um, and this is sort of the thing between, I think, when you look at Keynes, who was a big player in the 1932. So the same point that, that Kurt von Schleicher, after he becomes Chancellor of Germany in 1932 in January, it only lasts one year and, and you have the Friedrich List Society coming online, the Lautenbach plan for building like a new deal for Germany uh, based on and, and really shutting down the Nazi machine, shutting down eugenics, promoting industrial development, uh, scientific progress. Um, that was very similar to what Franklin Roosevelt was preparing to bring online in America around the same time. That only lasted one year. And, uh, and when Hitler was brought in, I'm not sure of all of the backroom deals, but Hindenburg definitely had some bribes, some weak spots. They capitalized on it, and he quickly inducted Hitler to become chancellor in February of 1933. And, and Hitler didn't lose any time burning down the Reichstag, right? He did that quick. And then declaring, you know, we need dictatorial powers, enabling acts to restore order because the Jews and the commies burnt down our, our, our parliament building. Never was the case. It was always, the, it was always an inside job by the SS. Um, but he never intended to give those those powers back to the people. It was always designed to be what it was. So, and that's when um, Kurt von Schleicher was killed at, in the the night of the Long Knives. I think that was like in 1934 or something. He was killed along with many others. But um, but Keynes came into play in the same time that the debate between Keynes and von Hayek is being set up by the London London Times. You have Keynes also being assigned the role to organize what becomes the London Bankers Conference. So starting in 1933, you have 65 nations being brought together in London to settle the problem of the Great Depression by creating a one world banking currency, a one world economic architecture. And Keynes is all behind that. Uh, and the whole idea is nobody's allowed to be in too much debt or be in too much surplus. Everybody has to be in mathematical equilibrium such that if a nation produces too much outside of its quota, it will be confiscated and then redistributed as whatever social engineers see fit. This was done again by Keynes when Keynes came back into play in 1944, overseeing the British delegation for Bretton Woods. That well, was his- again, Classical central planning and <laughs> centralization, right? I mean. Well, it's not, it's not, don't, don't oversimplify it. Cause yeah. 
you it's it's feudalism masquerading as capitalism but it's always feudalism it's not even central planning because you you also have good central planning too whereby you have a national bank used to fund the development of a nation for the good that is true that that harmonizes with personal freedom there's examples of that occurring and this is why they tried to kill franklin roosevelt twice with a with a banker's coup and with an assassination attempt in february of 1933 by Giuseppe zingara an italian freemason in america who who shot five times and barely missed uh, Roosevelt killing Surmak standing next to the, the mayor of Chicago, s- standing next to Roosevelt. But they wanted to, because Roosevelt was bringing back the Abraham Lincoln system of the greenbacks, but under a new name. Mm-hmm. He br- he brought back the Hamiltonian Friedrich List system of the National Bank, but under a new name because he couldn't he couldn't control the Federal Reserve. So the best thing he could do is he put one of his industrialist friends, Mariner Eccles, into the the chairmanship of the Federal Reserve to start kind of forcing it to abide by some national constraints. But otherwise, he had to create or use use the Reconstruction Finance Corporation as a national bank, even though it was created originally in the in before Roosevelt came into power. It wasn't doing much. And by the end of World War II, the the Reconstruction Finance Corporation had given more loans to businesses than all of the New York banks and the Federal Reserve combined. It was it was it was cre- it was the driving force. Of the map, and this is why people have a hard time placing Roosevelt in a category of either, you know, because it's like, yeah, he did big government, but you also had, and that's why, uh, like, libertarians attack Roosevelt because they're like he's a communist who did big government, but it's like the communists also attack Roosevelt because you had the biggest flourishing of entrepreneurship and private business under his watch too, so they're like, oh, he was a he was a whore for the capitalists, and that's why they hate Roosevelt, and both sides don't know how to how to pigeonhole because he he doesn't fit into those categories we've been told we have to fit our brains into and he hated Keynes like he actually said Keynes is 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 a mathematician with fetishes to his personal secretary and friend um Francis Perkins who wrote a book documenting their exchanges and Keynes openly called Roosevelt an economic incompetent he they didn't like each other and yet we are all today told by CFR Council on Foreign Relation funded uh historians that Roosevelt was a Keynesian and to be a good, and that's why they call it the Green New Deal today. They call it the New Deal because they're trying to revive, people have a sort of warm, warm, positive sentiment in their memory banks of the New Deal somehow being good, but it's fuzzy because because history, we don't know our history. So they they give it that warm, fuzzy sentimentality and they call it a green thing. The, the New Deal was anti-green. It was all based on massively increasing productivity, industrial output, um, on, and and I mean, so but they're using that and they're and they're telling us that that was what Roosevelt was. It wasn't that. So, but then coming out of the the whole process, you know, um, you you have again, the the Fabian Society creates a branch because the, the Fabian Society and the Rhodes Scholarship groups they work very closely together. The Fabians and the Rhodes Scholars, and they have organizing you know, uh, organizations like the Roundtable Movement that becomes the CFR. Um, you have subgroups like the Brookings Corporation, Brookings Institute, that becomes a subgroup of that for the leftists to, to organize themselves around. But then you also have things like, um, or no, it's actually, the word left and right means nothing anymore. Actually, forget the word leftist and right. It's, it, it's deceiving. It doesn't mean anything. Because you could have you could have like socialist feudalists and capitalist feudalists, but they're, they're united in their feudalism. And that's what you have with things like the Mont Pelerin Society. So some of the early sponsors of the uh, the 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 Mont Pelerin Society, the, the founders of it, become people like um, von Mises, uh, von Hayek, uh, Klotman, Frank Knight, the guy who 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 is the teacher of Milton Friedman, um, Walter Lippmann, who was working with Kudenhova Kalergi in setting up the American branch of the Pan Europa in the 1920s. That's Walter Lippmann, the guy who's working with Edward Bernays to use the appearance of democracy to create feudalism, right? Uh, Karl Popper, who's training George Soros, a young sociopathic George Soros. These are all founders of the Mont Pelerin Society, and they're earlier uh, all members of the 1939 Society for Renovation of Liberalism set up by von Hayek. All of them. All of them. And so the idea is, again, to, to repackage Adam Smith, Mill, Malthus, but under a new, with a bit of a Herbert Spencer, neo, neo-Darwinian spin in a new synthesis – and use that now as part of the tactics during the Cold War, the age of bipolarism, while the, the the Democrats are told they have to corral themselves around different types of Keynesianism. 
even though John uh, John F. Kennedy was was a Democrat, but he was anti Keynes. So was Franklin Roosevelt, though they worked with Keynesians. So some people who were around them were Keynesian. That doesn't mean that Keynesianism <laughs> had any Im- effect on the 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 origins of the policies that made JFK a threat to the oligarchy in terms of all of his political policies for um, the inve- investment tax credit, encouraging the the development of mass infrastructure and water projects on the continent of America or development in Africa. No, that was not Keynesian. It was anti because Keynes always wanted just a bank or a one world currency form of exchange to settle payments under a world government. And the Franklin Roosevelt networks around uh, Harry Dexter White did mass battle with the, the these eugenicists of Britain um, during Bretton Woods. And Keynes never forgave Dexter White. Dexter White died. I think he was probably killed in 1948 when he was, you know, rallying to fight to get uh, Henry Henry Wallace elected president in 1948. Um, but they, it was it's it's a different paradigm. I, I guess is how I'm I'm trying to think about this. And it seems like the Keynesians then, you know, they they have their their variants. You have the the modern monetary theory variation with its own uh, weird. It, it 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 takes the form of some of what made the United States work on the surface, but it, it extracts all of the substance, all of the actual. This is the way the Delphic system works, right? One of the ways How the, the systemic empire- theft also, you know, is a complex. I mean, it's always at the end of the day is about you know printing money, fractional reserve banking, and there's no sound money. I mean, that, I think that's the point. I think that people need to understand there's no sound money, uh, otherwise. We yeah. wouldn't have this systemic theft going on, you know, for such a long time, at least for a hundred years or so. Well, the way I see sound money is it has to be tied. Money only has value. It's a creation we create. We choose to give money value as a basis of exchange. But the yeah, thing but that- also it has to be limited. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, relative scarcity in gold or absolute scarcity in Bitcoin. You know, this is where we have, you know... Uh, prosperity we have uh well, technological bitcoin innovation really, let me ask you this does bitcoin yeah. have a what are the limits of bitcoin what what are, it, how many uh, 21 million 21 million and the last bitcoin or, or the last let just say it's not even close to 20 there's like a fraction below that whatever but uh, tw- the 21 million bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140 so it's mathematically totally predictable <laughs> like you but, know but how much can it subdivide how much can you subdivide? Well, divide one it? Bitcoin at the moment is, you know, is still 100 million uh, uh, satoshis or, you know, subunits, right? But you can, you could still like, you know, uh, make more subunits, you know, but, but the absolute what's the limit amount... on the subunits, because you can't get a limit unless you can limit the subunits. So what's the limit on the subunits? What, well, one Bitcoin equals you divide infinitely, right? Like any, any one dollar can divide infinitely, infinitely, infinitely. I could divide so what's what's but, the end? But, no, but it's like this this pizza this pizza comparison. You know, I mean, you you can cut it in you know in in molecular at atomic structure. You know, uh, parts a pizza, but it one pizza is one pizza. It's not going to get you know. It's not going to increase in the in the total absolute. You know, in the total amount. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but so if you could always I, if you could always subdivide forever, you're always getting infinite, and you could always give value to those infinite particles and subparticles and subparticles. Yeah, of the but it will increase in purchasing power. This is this is this. Is, I think this is the point. This is I think this is the ultimate point in Bitcoin. Once we have, uh, once we have reached you know the the point of hyper Bitcoinization, let's just say a critical mass of adoption worldwide or within many countries or communities or whatever, then you know you then you know the the unit of account thinking will change and then you know and then uh, compared to to the dollar or whatever or to any other fiat currency that you know increasingly loses purchasing power you know what causes uh, it to increase purchasing power huh what would cause it to increase purchasing power well uh, because you know as more and more people are uh, are holding it as a store of value as a medium of exchange as a unit of account are trading and are thinking you know in and 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 trading and and exchanging value as you said you know then it will increase uh i mean from my you know r- rational thinking and and from any other you know uh, 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 rational economist thinking is it would increase in 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 purchasing power right I don't know. I mean, because when you define purchasing power, let, let's define purchasing power first, because maybe we we're, we don't have the exact same definition. But when you when I think of purchasing power, I think of like one dollar yesterday buying me less than the same dollar today. Like the power of the dollar to purchase increases 
ba- right based on like some some something in the past when the same dollar was buying me less is that is that what you're thinking or what do you think of when you think of defining purchasing power yeah uh, with purchasing power i mean like you know like we know for example that uh, that the purchasing power of $1 uh in 1913 compared to now has lost uh, I don't know what is it 90 95 percent of of that value so uh like like as it, okay for the gold bucks for example you know like the a, a gold a gold coin can still buy you uh or gold ounce can still buy you you know a decent suit and a and a hotel room or something like that I mean this is the comparison that people always make with with gold so with uh and 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 once uh you know even let's let's just suppose you know let's just for the sake of it you know gold would become the gold the, you know again the gold standard the monetary standard then you know then you have because because gold has a relative scarcity there's like additional uh mining of of of, of gold every year like approximately between one and three percent as as far as i know so uh so there's a relative scarcity to it but with bitcoin you only have 21 million that's it you have 21 million that's the total amount which will be you know the last one will be mined in the year 2140 and as you know adoption increases yeah. more people you know holding so, it as a store of value trading it as a medium exchange and 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 also you know uh, what do you call it calculating it as a unit right. of account then it would you know logically you know uh, increase in purchasing power so that means yeah let's just say you know a dollar uh, but would, to, would, to would increase concrete, your purchasing power. when so we have the same idea of purchasing power as a definition, which I guess is similar to inflation too, right? Like that the inflation is that would be, yeah the opposite would be deflation. Then we have we have would have a deflation. You know, like technology is common. You connected. know, when, I, I'm just keeping it elementary for people who might be listening and they're like, yeah, what yeah, are these? yeah, yeah. No, yeah. but it's a good question. Actually. Okay, it's a fundamental. It's a really important question. Like like for example, uh, you know, Jeff Booth uh, with his book, uh, uh, why deflation is the key to an abundant future, and he's a, by now you know a, a pure Bitcoiner because he understands we need to get out of the system of the fiat system because we're thinking within that system. But once you know, for example, he always brings up technology, you know, technological innovation, uh, and it and becomes you know uh, it gets cheaper and cheaper. So that is is actually technology in essence in principle is actually deflationary because you know you get more and more value more utility more functional can i uh, ask just to keep it out of the realm because i mean the, the keynesians they they're math they're mathematical ivory tower people they don't like reality so we're not like that so i'm just curious to get it out of the realm of just too much theory uh give me some examples practically where this has happened oh uh Your technological like progress or practically, and, or well, yeah, well, practically, any uh, examples in in our recent or 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 farther past that you that you've studied that show us where we have done this, where we've we've uh, um, done exactly what you've said, and where technological progress has increased, uh, purchasing power has increased when this has been done. Because I, I just I just don't know. I I don't have examples okay. that I've seen. So, so if, I, we could I, just, no. if we could just focus on technological deflation, uh, it means you know like. Uh, like I don't know. Think of any like high tech device. Would it be a TV, de- a TV uh, device, or a ha- or a smartphone, a mobile phone? Right. It has it has more efficiency. It's faster. It has more processing power. It has more utilities. It has more whatever. Let's mm. say even apps. I mean, you can you can do anything. Or or think of Kodak for example. Right. I mean, it was it was. Uh, as soon as digital, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Digital processing of, of videos and pictures came, you know, a Kodak, a Kodak or the blockbuster videos, you know, they got up, obliterated, you know, because there came new technologies and it replaced it. And, you know, and with this, yeah. with this new technological innovation developments, everything became more, you know, as first of all, more afford- affordable, faster, more efficient, more functional, more utilities. So you, you, you had to spend less to acquire, you know, more technological advancements or innovation or uh, utilities, um, and for example, uh, I mean, just just let's just stick, for example, to Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin started off as I don't know as a f- fraction of a dollar uh, in in the year two thousand, let's say two thousand nine or something, and now you know, and and at that time, you know, I think it was this great you know case where this this um, a Bitcoin miner and and Bitcoin and cryptographer. Uh, I think it was a Hungarian spent like 10,000 euros, uh, 10, I'm sorry, 10,000 Bitcoin on a pizza. He just wanted, you know, to get it going, you know, as a meat of exchange. 
And and now you know you you just need a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a Bitcoin zero point zero zero whatever one uh, Bitcoin to to uh, to buy you know uh, uh, the same thing you know or a pizza or anything or even a real estate. I mean nowadays you can even in certain places, uh, whether it be in Dubai or in Europe or somewhere. I mean there are places where you can literally buy with a um, you know with Bitcoin. Um, Anything, you know, real estate, uh, cars, anything. Well, let, let me just quickly, before we go off onto that one, because there's two points. I guess there was a question as you were speaking in the previous example of the Kodak being replaced by the digital uh, camera systems. And I guess we could also include the, the digital recording devices yeah. tied to the whole telecommunications system of, of cell phones, which caused, you know, the old school technology to go to reduce in value as the new one increased in value and got cheaper in time, although... My wife just had to buy a very expensive phone. I don't know why they're still so expensive. But all that to say, uh, the, the the technology, though, it's, it strikes me, upon which the innovation was based uh, for the cell phone that has this these high-quality photo-taking uh, processes on them occurred because you have things like a NASA, you had a NASA driver program that created the basis upon which the whole satellite grids, the internet systems the 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 metals processing capabilities were all put online in by John F Kennedy and that involved the opposite of what you said in terms of this like a state driver process that brought a whole like grid of platform of tech on the line and gave subsidies to companies to do the job um so the example doesn't quite fit what i'm seeing is like the the idea what you were saying of uh well, you could see it in, in, I mean, you're talking about like, like state driven, like subsidized uh, entrepreneur, but I'm like... talking about like free market, like entrepreneurship, you know, where people, uh, because, you know, because there is still, you know, in certain uh, places of, uh, on this planet, there is still, I mean, there is competition, right? There is competition, there's entrepreneurship, there is technological innovation with it. It's now uh, partially a fully subsidized or state driven uh, that's another question, I think. But uh, you know, when you have uh, competition, when you have competition and uh, advancements in technological sectors, whether it be you know microprocessors, nanochip technology, I don't know, whatever that is, you know, or or uh, f f uh, what do you call it, like fiberglass uh, communication or satellite communication, or you know, just just I mean, we we could in any 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 field of electronics or or uh, or even you know. Uh, efficiency in in the engine propulsion yeah. system right so nowadays i mean okay we could talk about but that's also you know again because i mean nowadays even you 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 have to pay even more money for used cars as i've heard but that's because again it goes back to the monetary system to the fiat system where it's creating you know inflationary uh, 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 consequences and 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 that you know results again into it goes you know it results in, into into uh, yeah inflation or hyperinflationary uh, result you know um, uh, consequences you know of 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 other products. Yeah, I guess the problem is just that a lot, and I'm I'm totally in favor of like entrepreneurialism and and you know like there's a place for protectionism and there's a place in my mind for free markets too. I'm I'm not I'm not like ideologically all for one or all for the other. It's all about the context in my mind. Um, but like a lot of the companies that innovated a lot of these these really good things, fiber optic cables, other things, were all dependent upon um, a system of energy. Uh, creation and distribution that allowed them to have the productive capabilities to build the machinery test out their prototypes all of these things that them were not built because of the free markets per se like these grids were all required at different times in our past uh, a, a national in investment and concepts to create an environment for these things that we then can benefit from from our hydroelectric dams and other things so it's like I don't know of an example where you, I know you can map on this this system as a model onto things that already exist and and use it, but I don't know where it had ever created such a system of wealth that then drove an anti-inflationary process. I, in in any examples I can find in a pure sense in our our recent or or distant past.
I just yeah, can't. but if I give you if I give you, give you because I know the historical uh, you know example from Safed and Amusi, he he lays it out pretty well you know in his book Bitcoin Standard or even Fiat Standard, where you know when before actually you know the 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 detachment from the from the from the gold standard happened actually. Uh, not in 1971 or or you know or 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 sometime even before actually it was even much much earlier uh, before 1914 just uh, right before uh, the, the first world war and you know he talks about the label epoque and w w uh, the time you know in that time when we still had our you know society or civilization had the gold standard there were more or, or uh, originate original or, or what do you call it primary technological innovation which a lot of other technological innovation rest upon or 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 was dependent upon for a long time let's say for, for example you know like would it be you know propulsion system or uh, I don't know you know communication systems uh, so so there were a lot of you know uh, more more free-minded spirits you know uh, innovators uh, engineers inventors and there was just more capacities to to develop and to advance, you know, uh, human society, human civilization. Um, well, here's the, but, but here's the thing. I, I got to read the guy's book. I got to read his book. But yeah, what I, I from my my analysis, I know that um, looking at the banking history of America, like there's been, if you look at at Lincoln's greenbacks as one example, that was a period, and especially in the the immediate period after the war um of a lot of wealth creation like the the transcontinental railway was built up uh industrial pro like there there's a lot in the healing the recovery of the united states from the the british directed uh w civil war was was relatively miraculous um and bismarck commented on the the amazingness of, of how quick this was able to work but then what was what happened was you know you had the specie resumption act um which occurred, I think, in 1876 or 77, that began to, to really annihilate the greenbacks. And it brought in, it pegged dollar to a one-to-one -one relationship to gold. But then when I look at the the orbit, it's like nothing stopped immediately. Like in, in a mathematical space, you know, you, you get, you put in like one variable, you'll get an immediate effect on, in, in the computer program. But in reality, we're, we're, we have physical space time, we have momentum, you know, all this stuff. So all this momentum was created under under Lincoln and and the early part of the Ulysses S. Grant's administration for development, so it was a lot of momentum. So it continued even after the Species Resumption Act was brought in. But then what what started happening? What you could start seeing is all of a sudden you start getting massive destabilizations, fluctuations of the markets because now all of a sudden who's controlling the gold? Well, it was the gold barons. It was the the City of London that had controlled right. the, the Cecil Rhodes Mining Corporations, and then they were able to artificially manipulate the price by by de, by deregulating the market so that speculators could gamble on what they thought the price of the oil of the gold yeah. was going to be there's one of the reasons, reasons gold failed yeah yeah and then all of a sudden the u.s dollar became less of a reliable thing and and slowly the 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 the, the momentum started seizing up and seizing up for progress and then you started seeing inflation grow and the buying power began to to you right. know fall as, as less people wanted to invest in the u.s dollar but it was all like based on these real political agendas of which are often, I think, overlooked by the academic writings of people who tend to comment on these things. And they don't think about the fact that you have this oligarchical agency with their their techniques of subverting nations by getting us to just think about, you know, a apolitical ideologies or, or, or filters of analysis about banking or other things. I don't know so much about France. I know that Sidi Carnot was was ushering in, who was killed, right, in, in 1895. He was ushering in a robust Colbert. It was like a Colbertist revival. The same thing that inspired the U.S. was was being brought back in the 1890s in, in France around dirigisme, uh, you know, state credit for big infrastructure and things like that. But then that under Clemenceau, that started also getting undermined, too, as, as they were they were, so it's a bit of a weird thing. I, 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 I'm not too sure about the France case. I would like to read this guy's book, mm -hmm. but, um, but my concern is, is again, like what I, what I know is that the cause of the purchasing power increasing or uh, anti-deflationary spending, because you've, you have, de you have inflationary and, uh, and deflationary spending. So there, there's some types of spending, which like if I'm a farmer and I got no tractor, but I know how to farm, I might get, create a little bit of a debt to take a loan to buy that tractor in order to farm my land 
such that I'm going to produce more abundance that, that by like next year, I'll pay off the tractor and have more free energy to reinvest, to, to pay for my workers and my, my growing, you know, farm business. Um, same thing for a nation, you know, like if, if I'm a nation and I, and I take out a debt, to, to build a bunch of casinos because I think I can make more money off of state managed casinos like you have in Canada. You know, it's all, a lot of Quebec and shit. Like this is all of the vice buying drugs is state state run in, in Canada. You got to go to the, you, you want to buy alcohol in Quebec? You got to go to a state state right. owned uh, alcohol uh, uh, store um, because they make more money. But it's like, but at the same time, you're destroying the overall vitality of your people to exist. You're, you're by getting them all on drugs or on, di- addicted to gambling it makes your nation actually weaker, less productive, and thus buying power collapses. Inflation is, is going to increase as you print more money circulating or whatever. But, but it's it's you can even have the same amount of money and it could still lose value. Like even if you cap the money at a at a at like in a limited amount, it could still lose value if your overall nation is not producing in an, in a better way. So for me, it's like if Bitcoin is tied to processes that are increasing the qualitative productive powers, okay, good. Yeah, but, that would increase the efficiency, uh, you know, efficiency of allocation of capital. Well, also, have you know? it as an article of faith that people will just naturally like organize to create, you know, electricity grids. If I just like let everybody just like do their thing and have like free reign Bitcoin with no national government, all of a sudden I'm going to have like a repaired, you know, mm-hmm. electricity rail grid. Other thing, no, I that I don't see that happening. I think you need to get people to take their nation back, <laughs> and right. then you know. <laughs> fight to expunge the deep state and then look to the problems again, in which case Bitcoin can play feasibly a very important role. But I just, I I guess my thing, I'm reacting a little bit to the the fact that many promoters of Bitcoin that I encounter, I don't think you're like this, but but a lot do tend to see it from the standpoint of I've already given up on trying to say to take back my nation. I've given up. And this is my way of getting outside of the game into my little local uh, feeling that I'm free in a local. Oh, I see. I was saying no. There's a spectrum. I mean, I'm, I'm. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah. But I, I get a lot of that. I get I'm, against no, against you know. Yes. Uh, I'm more now because I, you know, also you know, read a lot about you know, Hoppe and and and. I mean, I do understand you know the basic principal problems that that the state, the nation state, and the government. And uh, I mean, I'm more for local, you know, communities, local government, local, you know. Uh, real, I mean, you know, people talk about democracy, but but I think we need to go back to the roots uh, and and even enhance, you know, the 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 characteristics which which they have. For example, you know, in in, in Switzerland, you know, where they uh, they vote on and and they can decide over, you know, regional c- communal uh, uh, local, you know, uh, decision making processes. You know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, but you know, there's a spectrum of people. You know, whether they call them libertarians or anarchists or <laughs> like totally anti-nation state, anti-government. But there's a really a, a huge spectrum uh, within the, within the Bitcoin. So we can't even I, I couldn't even pinpoint. You know, like, but I think uh, the the principles of Austin Crumbs sound money. You know, uh, 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 an absolute with an absolute scarcity, a decentralization, non-confiscatability. Uh, so there is a lot of you know properties and characteristics which Bitcoin has, which you know gold. You know that's why a, a lot there's a lot of reason why gold uh, failed. You know in the first place because it always goes back to trust, to centralization, and to confiscation, and to you know you cannot really use it uh, as a. I mean you can maybe you know yeah. use it as a store of value, but but then it, it, there's a limit to it, and that's why Bitcoin uh, from our or my point of view or perspective it just has. So so many, you know, positive and and un, which hadn't and had not been resolved uh, until uh, now for the first time in human history. But yeah, yeah you know. no, as, as as the pragmatic side of myself, I'm like all for that. So I'm looking. I look for things that will work to get the job done. Um, mm-hmm. I'm I'm against extremes because I know that's how the oligarchy plays us into like being all big state or all uh, personal freedom or whatever you know, and they they always get us that way. Um, Whereas me, I'm like always trying to find, well, what's the principled harmony of what appears to be opposites in a principled way, which which causes the oligarchy to lose power Mm -hmm. every time it's done and causes us to become more in alignment with natural law, which is why. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because, so you know, like, I'm a huge fan of, you know why I'm a huge fan? Because you talk about, you know, all the structural problems we have. You know, we, you talk about the oligarchies, the city of London. So I, my my vision, I mean, my personal vision is really like uh, once we have this critical mass adoption that we can finally start. I mean, it's not going to resolve everything, you know, but it will structurally from a root uh, upwards, it will, I mean, transform everything. You know, like Buckminster Fuller said, you don't need to fight the system. Uh, I'm just paraphrasing. You just need to create a new system, right? So that's what what we are hoping and what we are wishing. We are, uh, uh, that's uh, sort of our ethos and mission uh, amongst our Bitcoiners is like to create a new system, right? So we are so we can make the old one obsolete, so we don't have to fight all these you know criminals that have been systematically stealing from us. Not only like monetarily, financially, but also technologically, spiritually. I mean, on every fucking level you can imagine, we've been like totally like fucked up, right? You're right, especially in the last hundred well, years. <laughs> All I can say is, if we're going in a rant, <laughs> da da da. I, I, no, it's, it's a healthy red. It's it's good righteous indignation, and it's rightfully it, it's healthy. Um, my 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 point though is, I don't think that the oligarchy will let anybody just go off and and recreate their own system without killing them. Like we've seen in Maui, you know, like. Uh, there, there's so many places where you think you have these idealistic communities of people who are like self-sustaining and they're they're off the grid so, now i'm always not off the grid but really it, it was a very self-sustaining very very autonomous community annihilated by space-based what appears to be space-based lasers that have it's been definitely developed direct energy weapons. weapons it's all right. every, I mean, yeah, yeah i mean the history is so long i, I know mean, i'm quite persuaded i'm quite persuaded very that that's, overwhelming or you got all these people you know in like pennsylvania in, in uh uh, the, the, one of the densest, like farm, small and medium farm growing regions in the world in um, in uh, Ohio that has seen some conscious derailment of toxic waste spillage into their water system, ground systems. And I mean, I, I see all of this as coordinated. Um, so I do think that we do need to fight the oligarchy. And I, yeah. I don't think that the oligarchy will sit back and just let a whole bunch of autonomous communities just like go Amish and like go solo um, very easily. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's that's my that's my concern. Um, but do you think it's a little bit too late? Sometimes, sometimes I'm thinking, oh my god, people are so fucking I asleep. Do. I don't that's, know. That's the cynicism I fight with too inside of myself because it's like, well, like me. I, look, tell you what, I. Um, before Trump was elected, um, and I, I was sure that Hillary was coming in, I, I kind of disengaged from politics quite a bit. And uh, and I stopped my my magazine. I stopped writing. Um, and it was only one day in 2017 that I, I for, for, for shits and giggles, I like logged back onto my Canadian Patriot website, working in my office job. And I just, just a curiosity, just look at the, at the dashboard just to see if there's any activity, you know, did, did 10 people show up this month or something? I know I haven't updated it in two years and, uh, there's like 5,000 people showing up every day to my website that hadn't been touched for, for years. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and, uh, and so I was like, wait a minute, this is something has changed. And, uh, and I, and I realized that, that something did shift with the idea that the U S was not hopeless, even though it, it since JFK's murder, it got so controlled and so dominated by this evil entity. I was like, wow, something is, is a little bit different than I expected. So I began to write again. I was like, okay, I should probably use this to, to help contribute to the process in a positive way somehow. And I started noticing that I, I was submitting my articles to websites that I had formerly under Obama. I was writing. I, I, I started my Canadian Patriot in 2012 and I was submitting my articles to all sorts of alternative media magazines and stuff. And nobody would touch my stuff. And then all of a sudden, all everything I was submitting was getting picked up, published. I, oh, I was like, getting paid for some of my stuff. And I'm like, what? Something yeah. is different than the zeitgeist, right? Like there's a different. Um, so that forced me to um, soul search a little bit to think like, is, was my cynicism ill placed? Where did I go wrong in, in my thinking um, that the new world order was like, it's just a matter of when it's 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 a done deal. And um, also too, you know, because I was, I told you, I was working with the LaRouche organization of the Schiller Institute. Um, I, I had been organizing for uh, LaRouche's program 
in Canada, you know, I, I would go to Ottawa in 2007, 2008, 2009, and we did table organizing with the population. And so I was doing this like every day. This was my, my, my thing for, for a sustained period. But part of my mess, my message to people, even though I didn't fully believe it was the financial system is going to collapse. It's all based on a derivatives bubble of unpayable debts. It's going to collapse and it's designed to collapse because they want to kill us and re reduce the world population. That was part of my messaging. And it, it took me a while to, to, to research and fully integrate that. But part of it was we don't have to. We can do Glass-Steagall. We can break up the banks the way Franklin Roosevelt did. We can get a, a national recovery. We can. Uh, we were talking about the new Silk Road. So the idea that the, that there is you know a possibility for a for a, a new Silk Road program of reconstruction um, across Eurasia that we could participate in that could save Europe that could save that. We were talking about that, and you could read the writings from some, some of the 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 magazine we were we were running with was called Executive Intelligence Review. And going back to like 1992, they were already publishing material, like putting out the design strategically for how the new Silk Road could break the oligarchy and stop the new world order and uh, giving conferences all over the world to promote this. And they were being picked up by people like Sergei Glaziev, Putin's advisor, who is a student of LaRouche and is said so openly. And leading figures in China have, were bringing some of these, these LaRouche representatives to Beijing to speak and give conferences on how this works. How did America do Hamiltonian banking? How did Friedrich List do this in Germany? And, and how could this apply to the Eurasian Russian Chinese experience? Um, but it was only with 2013 that Xi Jinping announced the Belt and Road Initiative and the new Silk Road. It, it, I didn't think it was going to happen. And then he, a, a head of state goes and says it. This thing I'd been talking about, they go and say it and then they do it. Um, and I'm like, okay, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we are not privy to, even those of us who watch alternative media. But there's cracks that show us that the oligarchy has less of a hold on us than they want us, than 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 they want to believe. They want us to believe that they are gods. They actually don't. That's why the League of Nations didn't work the first time because their their attempt at a world government a century ago was the League of Nations. It failed because they're not gods, though they want to be. And uh, and so today it's sort of the same thing. China and, and Russia have used the power of the nation state to block the the COP26, COP27 carbon, you know, carbon dioxide uh, reduction quotas. That was that the only reason why that didn't succeed was not because of us in Canada or the USA or European countries. It's because of India, China, Russia, some African countries, but specifically China and India, but mostly China that blocked these things from becoming law. They stopped it. Well, yeah, blocking the a fraud. I mean, uh, for good thanks God. I mean, they're you know <laughs> because it's a, it's it's a huge scientific. Yeah, we'd already be dead. Like there would be nothing to even like have this conversation on at that point if this is if that world government was already imposed. So it, it's bought us time to strategize. And I mean, I'm seeing that Trump hasn't given up. There's a possibility of a Trump Bobby Kennedy uh, Jr. Uh, alliance possibly that could feasibly happen to be part of the fight to, uh, that could, I mean, there's so much fraud. It's hard to say, right? Like would the, obviously people would vote for that, but would the, the level of organized fraud within the voting systems permit that? Oh my God, I don't even know, man. Surface. Yeah. It's all call coming to the surface. It's unbelievable that the yeah. successful of corruption. And but there's a fight. There's a fight. So I know that yeah. I got to be part of the fight mm -hmm. while the fight is happening. <laughs> and, uh, at that point, if there was no fight, then it's like survival mode. Like I'm going, you know, <laughs> like I have to think a totally different way. <laughs> I'm not used to thinking. To come to the mountains. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At that point, I'm Join busy. Us. I'm knocking you at the door. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta yeah. go deer hunting or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll forge for rabbits. <laughs> to, okay. To yeah, I mean, that's where we're at. I, Right. I do. I do think that if we just take what works in in our past, principally, uh, it it would do a, a remarkable amount of job, uh, good work to to destroy the oligarchy's power base and elevate us to a better way. I think Russia and China are, are fighting really much much more valiantly than people realize, and I think we could be a part of that fight. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, it's it's an interesting time of history to be alive. That's for sure. It's a very oh yeah history. yeah and. I mean, there's a there's a different chapter which I would want to talk about maybe next time about you know a, a, a very possible scenario. I mean, there's hardcore data and scientific facts and studies done on micronova solar shots that could happen by the latest of 2050. A natural cycle and a very natural cycle. I mean, you know, I'm uh, you've, I'm, I'm sure you've 
I heard of uh, Suspicious Observer, Ben Davidson, the guy is- I, I love him. I love that show. He's, yeah. He's, he's, he's genius. I mean, I mean, yeah. you know, of course, you know, he says he, he doesn't have a crystal ball. There's no like, you know, f- firm prediction or something like that, but it is very, very realistic that, you know, there's like different earth disaster cycles coming and happening. And, you know, the magnetic field of the earth is exponentially reducing uh, since, I don't know, for many decades now. So all these like parameters and factors are playing in. And uh, so we are all already like sort of preparing ourselves for this kind of scenario, what we're going to do. I mean, we are, you know, it's on top of a mountain some, somewhere. So, you know, I guess, but there are certain places on this earth, I guess in Colorado somewhere, I don't know where, where this guy is, or is in Texas, there's, it's, it's like pretty safe uh uh, because there's going to be really huge disaster cycles and, you know, all the information communication grids going to be taken out. And then we don't have to worry about Bitcoin anymore because we don't have any, you know, we're going to go back to the stone age probably. And we need, you know, something to eat and, you know, we need to survive and, and take care of each other. Now anyway, we're back to, uh, to trading uh, seashells. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. But, you know, I, I, we could talk about this in a future podcast because I do find astroclimatology uh, absolutely important and fascinating. Um, yeah, but so people yeah, put the heads into this. That. This is what I don't understand. I'm asking people like who are you know sending satellites into the orbit for Bitcoin uh, transactions. I mean, like, how do you guys prepare? I mean, what if what if a micronova solar shot happens and it takes out all the fucking you know communication information system? What are you going to do? What are we going to do? In Quebec. Look, I mean, people could say this happened in Quebec in 1989. We lost. We we got a direct hit by a small uh, super uh, uh, coronal mass ejection. Really, that hit Quebec like dead on. And our grids were shot out. It took two weeks to start getting electricity back on at the time. This is 30 years ago. So we we still had some manufacturing industrial uh, production in place in Quebec that was able to build new trans, uh, transmitters, transformers that were all shot. Today, that's gone. Like, we don't have that anymore. All of the productive capability to do that ourselves is gone. Um so yeah, like it, we get missed quite often by by coronal mass ejections that that come pretty close, I think or that just that. Pop, you know if we get if we get a dead on slamming yeah, yeah you can really overpower overcharge the grid, and yeah deactivate your satellite all this terrible stuff that would involve chaos beyond belief beyond belief yeah absolutely and people and need to take this stuff very seriously very seriously as and could there's things you could do. There's things you could do. Like you don't have to just wait for it to hit. You, there are ways of creating uh, Maxwell sort of uh, magnetic shells to protect um, your satellites, to do things, to have productive right. systems in place, to build the transformers. If they get blown out, you want to be able to build them within a day. You know, you don't want to let your hospitals have no electricity for weeks or refrigeration go to shit for weeks. You know, you want to be able to get stuff back online. So there's things we could do as human being problem solvers. Right premeditate or pre- preemptively act on this sort of thing but we're not like you said people who should be thinking about this are just i don't know man it's just yeah there's a myopia um yeah. and officially we are not even on that kardashev what do you call it kardashev uh, uh evolutionaries uh, whatever scale or something like that i think we're not even on, on the kardashev what is it is it called kardashev i don't know whatever you know it's like the evolutionary degree of, of of civilization or something like that but anyway i mean i i do think there are some technologies developed but not accessible to us within the military industrial complex but that's a whole whole chapter by itself yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> so matthew i didn't i don't want to i'm sorry i don't want to take up too much time but there was one fundamental question i wanted to okay, all right one, one last one last, one last thing you mentioned in one of your recent interviews because uh it reminded me of the interview with with this guy let me let me just uh screenshot this here um uh on, uh put it on the here uh, the immortality key the secret history of the religion with no name by brian c morarescu uh and it goes about you know very deep into psychedelics uh uh and it, it you know it it uh, it's got beautiful you know book reviews and everything else so, uh, and and joe rogan had an interview with this author uh brian c morrescu and you mentioned in one of your recent interviews that you think i'm, I'm done uh, i don't want to paraphrase you but you said something like uh you know it could be that jesus christ and his followers were using psychedelics and and hallucinogenic you know uh, substances uh, do you want to like elaborate? Like, do you have a position on psychedelics at all? Are you an advocate? That's what I'm interested in. What do you think about like Christianity and religion and spirituality and enlightenment? Uh, yeah, is there? I, I, I think that the oligarchy. I mentioned that their obsession 
has been the revival of global oligarchical feudalism under some unipolar imperial class um, with an occult inner inner um, esoteric um, elite with their own uh, you know occult perspective on the universe of an evil god that is that they're made in the image of um, a whole perverse inner culture core um, with their that that involves grooming the next generation according to these long traditions going back to ancient days of Babylon and the Roman Empire, the, the most evil days of the Roman Empire. It's the same worst of those traditions. And they want to organize society with um, different layers of these si similar but diffused um, uh, occult religious orders down all the way to the plebes who are supposed to just be happy happy slaves with their own spirituality the the auxiliaries above will be happy slaves with their own their own spirituality and their own you know uh egotistical mythologies that give them a sense of elitism but they themselves are are peons for the higher echelon above them um all the way to the points of, of some inner core so i think that that's the general and you need a political structure a political economic structure to make that happen materially and that's the whole fight for world government a depopulated you know cop 27 type of green global uh dictatorship you know masquerading maybe with some capitalist surface appearances but not really it's all feudalism but ultimately their i think their their primary obsession has been to create a global religious uh system that shaping the self-image of man around um a way of being and thinking of our spirituality which is a rehashing of the old um Eleusian mystery religions of ancient greece persia babylon and, and rome which are animated by i think uh psychedelics early psychedelics that were derived i believe that um the, the author that you referenced brian whose last name I can't pronounce. More, more, more rescue, yeah. More rescue. Uh, I think that it's true what he's saying, that ancient cults used psychedelics derived from plant or wheat wheat blight, um, which does have a bit of a hallucinatory you know, effect on the mind and other things, mushrooms, other, other forms of mushrooms in various shema, shema, shamanic uh rituals have used that to also have a similar uh psychedelic experience that was part of the rites of initiation within the mystery religions pre-christian and also this is what people like saint augustine and the early christian uh fathers were fighting against was the perversion of the uh of of early christianity by these sects that were just rehashing the old uh mystery religions that involved, you know, Baal worship, Dionysian worship, uh, Apollo worship, Apollo just being a prototype for Lucifer, who was sort of the rebellious son of Zeus, who, uh, you know, had too big of an ego and was punished and fell, but was still the god of light. So that's that's Apollo. That And before Apollo, the, Apollo was sort of the, re, the revamping of the god of Marduk, the, the key god of the Babylonian mystery schools. Um, so the, these gods just sort of get rehashed rebranded according to different cultures that they're going to be applied to is but it's the same model um so i think that the jesuits were created by the habsburgs as part of one dimension of a multifaceted secret society operation of gnostic cults to undermine and undo authentic christianity which is based upon a moral the moral faith, but also moral action at the same time. So faith and action, not faith or action. Um, to love God, love your fellow neighbor, and love yourself, as as the book of Matthew prescribes, in a manner that is anti-imperial. So you want to do it from the standpoint of organizing against powers and principalities who are the enemies of Christianity, and not simply like, you know, making people feel good. But the mystery schools, I think, that are being revived now and and Brian Murzescu, uh, also Graham Hancock, is another popular promoter of this uh, today, is essentially reviving the old ancient mystery cults um, that Augustine and others did battle with under a new 
more synthetic uh, drug cults calling itself in some cases Christianity. Like it, it'll be repack. It's being repackaged some in some cases for neo pseudo Christians or, or or people who don't want to be atheists anymore or whoever. And it's it's going it's being set up as a groundwork for a new global synthetic religion with a UFO twist. So they're also preparing the idea that we communicate with beings from other dimensions, which different people thought of were as ETs, but in actuality, these are most likely that we've been told beings from the 11th dimension or fifth dimension or seventh dimension, whatever the fuck those things are. Cause really they're just mathematical entities that don't exist. Um, as far as like these dimensions, right. So they're, 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 pre they're preparing the climate for that. And there's things like blue beam like project blue beam is one of many different operations that have been refined over the cold war to use holographic technology, light, light, shows in 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 the sky that will then project either you know christ coming back like they've tried to do in brazil a couple of years ago or like they tried to do to overthrow castro under the uh uh edward lansdale project of uh el elimination by illumination which is what you know was, the idea was the cia was going to project lights a light show over cuba projecting the second coming of the christ who wants the cubans to overthrow castro who's the antichrist that was like a cia project that jfk oh, stopped yeah yeah uh so they've been working on this sort of shit for a long time so ben but, from brown you know with his last card the last card that i think that that was his one of his last words vanna from brown you know with his the, sort of they, they would use it as a false flag alien invasion he had a friend he had a friend who recorded or who, yeah. who testifies that mm -hmm. she heard him say that, that yeah. he told that to her. And it's possible. I mean, he was, he was on the inside. He, he knew how the machine works. So the idea that they would use like an alien invasion to try to unify the world around a, a common threat, that that's something that was even put online. I'm, we're making a documentary about this. My wife and myself wow. and Jason, uh, our friend, Jason Dahl, who's a, a master cool. filmmaker on uh, how the same agencies that killed JFK, um, including Alan Dulles, everyone JFK fired, Charles Cabell, Richard Bissell, who was the manager of Area 51 and the deputy director of the CIA, who worked with to overthrow Castro as well. Um, they're the same. They were all participating in a leading way into the UFO cult throughout the entirety of the Cold War. Um, so we're going to go with some crazy detail there. But I think, yeah, what you're seeing with the it's it's not just the immortality key that's trying to bring back or, rev or romanticize the cult of Eleusis and the cult of Dionysius, but there's many, there's thousands of these books all being promoted. There's there's Netflix videos, documentaries, other things to promote this idea that that's what Christianity was. Christ was just an in, an initiate into the Eleusian drug mysteries, and that's how he was able to recruit so many people because he ha gave them drugs. I completely, I think it's satanic. I think this is actually satanic, mm -hmm. and I don't believe in like. I don't use that word lightly, and I don't believe in like a literal force that is Satan, but I believe in evil. That human yeah. beings can be evil, yeah. and this is part. I mean, of just look at the pedophilia, the systemic pedophilia, and the Satanism and the sadistic Satanism. I mean, it's it's mind blowing. You know, every time I'm like, we're like, okay, we know everything now, you know, and then you wake up again next day, and like, oh my God, it's beyond it's imagination of an evil. I yeah. mean, it's it's mind. It's it's really. I have no words sometimes, but yeah, yeah, yeah. no, me too. Me too. Uh, so that's that's my thought. That's my thought on this shit. Is I, I think it's it's a satanic uh, mm -hmm. new spirituality controlled by the elite as part of a new uh, global great narrative that they want to bring online. But it's nothing to be trusted. And I'm not against like look for psychedelics. I the way I approach it is there for for extreme cases of of hardcore depression where your brain is is badly wired. Mm -hmm. Certain types of psychedelics might under controlled uh, a controlled circumstance help to depattern and and help give you the type of space you need to find a way of thinking out of your depression maybe but the issue that is often left out is that the reason why people are so freaking depressed is because we have such an unnatural system that is ultimately of globalization that is so unnatural and and ultimately evil that we're told is good that we have to adapt to that we know deep down inside is not and so, of course, people get nihilistic. They, they, you know, our culture is shit. Our economic system is shit. We got no prospects for a future. So, of course, people will get depressed. And sure, then you could find radical therapeutic techniques to help people live happily or satisfactorily within that corrupt system. But at the end of the day, that has to be dealt with. <laughs> and that's often not right. even discussed. So, um, 
And my last message for people who want to um, either do psychedelics or want to continue to, or maybe get into it to explore, explore psychedelics to open up new path doors of perception of their mind, the way all this yeah, creativity or, you know, understanding, like it's about also yeah. about comprehension, like comprehending from a totally different perspective. Okay. You have never thought of, you know, like so being creative or maybe, but what I would say is most, they want to skip steps. They want the effect of creativity without having first learned how this this beautiful instrument called our mind even works naturally in the first place. So they've only known how their mind works when it is not natural, but they've never gotten a, 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 an experience because of our shit education system and shit culture. Right. They've never an, gotten to ex get the taste of how to work and use this beautiful instrument in the first place. And they want to just then skip steps from a, a sick state into a creative psychedelic state that maybe might give them a better spirituality without learning how the mind works first. So I would just say, Learn yeah. how the mind works when it's being rigorous, uh, productive, listen to classical music, read original writings, like do original work and start coming, write, write your thoughts down. Like people should learn how the mind works in, in a sober, creative way and then revisit with some psychedelics if you want or something and, and compare, are you more effective mm -hmm. that way? Is that a more effective type of creativity than the, than the type you had when when you were using your, your instrument uh, in, a, in a sober or not, you know, but come up, but, but don't skip steps. That's my whole thing. Don't, every right, time people right, skip steps, right. things get messy. <laughs> right. I mean, I can only, you know, I know it from other people's encounter and experience and also from my own. And I mean, I, I can only speak positively about it. Uh, would it be, you know, uh, psilocybin or, um, you know, uh, other you know, so-called magic mushroom? It, it really, I mean, it, it really, um, it, it's a key, it's a key, it's a, it's a shortcut, to be honest with you. It is a shortcut and it's a key that you can open any portal, any door you can go into with a question, you know, with, uh, and it, it really helps you, you know, to whatever that is, whether it's a trauma, a depression, a something that is really, uh, or you talked about the educational system or about, you know, childhood, about parenthood, you know, I mean, you grow up with all these, all this shit, uh, you know, all your life long. And then it it catapults you into really a different, uh, you know, perception, consciousness, thinking process, you know, uh, dimension. Uh, well, like I said, I, I I did a lot of shrooms in my day as well, um, and I, I I could say for the most part it was a it was a positive experience. Um, back when I, but I mean, you know, I, I was still. It's the it's the me that was. Uh, still walking in a lot of ignorance. I, I I didn't start my exploration about what the hell was shaping my world. Um, and for what it was, it, I I wouldn't say it's evil. I wouldn't say I I would say I had good experiences through that. Sometimes I had some bad trips too. Um, but the overall idea of shortcuts for me has become now through twenty years of like pretty much ongoing research. And like obsessive ongoing research to try to figure out the truth in an uncompromising way and, and to figure out how I can become a better person and a better possible leader that I need to become because I'm not there yet. That's that that um and I you know I I I immerse myself in speeches of JFK and Martin Luther King to study how they're thinking, how they're feeling. I read a lot of speech. I read so for me, I'm I'm trying to use a lot of very high standards as my role models, and I've noticed that. It didn't take me long to notice that my mind on shrooms or on weed was not helping me when I began that that new identity and that new type of exploration. It didn't help me. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that in a very um, light way, but it it probably was crippling when I started that type of new type of rigor and self-discipline of my mind and my research. Mm -hmm. It was doing the opposite of what I wanted, so that's just where that's my experience uh, for me. I it might be different for other people. Everyone's a different person, but that's for me. So I, you know, and there's a fundamental difference, right? I mean, between like THC, you know, cannabis and psychedelic, like like psilocybin or magic, magic mushroom, you do that maybe maybe if you do it like on a regular basis at all, like once a year or every two or three years. You know what I'm saying? Like this is not something like I don't, don't know. I I don't know about the frequency. Just, all you know. all I know is the oligarchy wants us to be on it. That's why the the Harvard psilocybin project was created by MK Ultra in 1953 and all, ran all the way up through the 1960s. That's where Ted Kaczynski was processed. Oh. Um. The, the reason why psilocybins are a part of our world is because the CIA and the same people that want to kill us want it to be there. Mm 
-hmm. It's not like it got out of control and then the hippies just were so great that they had to do a war on drugs to try to put it back in the bottle. It wasn't that. The war on drugs was designed to fail and to create more organized crime networks that were affiliated with those same people who were in the banks, in Wall Street, in London, in Washington, who were on the surface trying to put every petty drug, you know, drug dealer in prison. It was never meant to work. It was always designed to make the problem even worse and make people want it even more. And that's why, like, so psilocybins, just to restate, just like LSD-25 and just like DMT yeah. were products of CIA MK Ultra research and were put into our culture because they want it there. Yeah. But it's always always the intention behind it. Also, is determined. You know, it's very important. I think. You know, what, what's the intention? How do you, how do you? What's the set and setting? How do you? How do you use it? You know, how, you know. Are you being manipulated? You know. I mean, is it big? Is it out of a free intention and a free? You know. Uh, I don't know. Is there some subtle differences? Do you see or or? I mean, I do like get I it. You know, I, I think for people who are in in a state of serious trauma and depression, there yeah. might be therapeutic benefits to depatterning which is which is what the silo, uh, psychedelics are quite good at um depatterning neural pathways that are too like locked in and rigid um that might be beneficial from a therapeutic standpoint but you can do that as well i think in a more organic way that might take more work in a more durable substantial way sure. without that right it's just that sometimes in an emergency you might need that if you're like on the verge of committing suicide mm -hmm. um Otherwise, probably I'm, I'm come to the place now where I'm like, I don't think that there's too many positive applications of it at this stage in human civilization. I think we have to get rid of the oligarchy and revisit the question. <laughs> I uh, think we have to. Yeah. Maybe, yeah that, that's very, very fascinating. Your, your, your perspective and your position on that. Okay. Okay. But even like, uh, like in a certain setting, you know, with a shaman, shaman or curandero in the jungle, you know, you, you spend like three months in the jungle, like, a um, like a holistic ayahuasca, you know, ceremony. Is that something? No. Because I've never done that. I'm just, you know, from, I've never done that either. I, I've seen a lot of testimonies of people like Graham Hancock, who I've, I've yeah. a lot of Graham, Graham Hancock's work, who's done a lot of that. And, no, I mean, I, I don't, I think that every culture had their imperial drug cults and mystery religions mm -hmm. that were tied to different types of what, you know, in the West, we might call like South American shamanistic or like African voodoo or other shamanistic um, structures that had their own, that had variations on the theme, but they're all the same variations and all the same theme. And I think they're ultimately things that cripple our ability to be the type of the type of humans that are made in the image of a living, loving, creative, reasonable God that the oligarchy has been trying to destroy and undermine in every religion, as far as it, whenever it manifests in the Islamic context or in the Buddhist context or Hindu context, there's this very positive, brilliant idea of, of uh, human beings as creative geniuses with dignity, freedom that we will fight for and die for to defend and organize systems and laws in, in defense of against the oligarchy, whether it's, and, and, and then there's, there's the very, there's the same techniques that are used to undermine that in ancient times in India, in China, in, in the advanced Olmec cultures that had advanced civilization in South America that involve, um, a, a similar, similar techniques, mm -hmm. uh, Aztecs, other things. And uh, so I, I, the way I see it, my, my current analysis is, is that the shamanistic religions um, or spiritual paths are carryovers, residuals of the oligarchical agencies that destroyed from within the societies that were very advanced and elevated mm -hmm. of the Americas, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, or of Africa as well that had very advanced civilizations that were like far advanced than even Europe in the, in the 12th century that were undermined from within by these organized cults that usually have a common mm -hmm. uh organizing center mm -hmm. are you going to incorporate this what you just talked about into the documentary uh, series oh, i might but fascinating. it's so yeah. hard because there's so many moving parts uh -huh. that i know it's difficult for people's minds to sort of look at 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 several processes at the same time um that i might have to do a series of videos mm -hmm. or focus more on the ufo psyop and maybe just allude to the okay uh the the religious manipulation 
but I don't know how to make it work yet fully. I'm still working on this. I've gone through like 18 scripts I and see. I'm trying okay. to make it work. Makes sense, yeah. But hey, uh, just for the final question, uh, this whole Grosh test, you know, hearing and, you know, with this with this UFO, is that's a, that's a total military intelligence psyop. Yeah, right? it's a military intelligence psyop. Oh, yeah, right. we're all being fucked with. They're screwing with us. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, th yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. going to be in the documentary. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're really looking for. When is it going to come out? What, what, I mean, are you hopefully soon? I mean, hopefully, very soon. I, I'm I'm aiming for September. Okay. Okay. Maybe so, mid mid to late September. Right now, it's still in script stage, so we'll see how many. Usually, when I do it, you know, my our, our filmmaker will produce a, a beautiful thing, but with a ton of problems, and then I'm gonna have to send it back. And we do course, like eighteen. Yeah. Ratings yeah, it's a or process. More, and then yeah. finally, we have a product, so it'll 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 come. Well, very uh, looking forward. Very excited. Uh, so, Matthew, uh, where else can people find you uh, on on besides? Is there anything coming up besides the documentary? Are you writing another book or? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you yeah, are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book on the uh, science, science unshackled, sort of going through the subversion of of science from a few thousand years ago to the present. Oh, okay. Yeah, it'll be fun. Um, so that that's that's almost done. Uh, I have very little to do. Maybe that that should come out by by you know Christmas time, maybe November. My 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 wife is also working on uh, the occult origins of fascism. Her volume <laughs> two of her series, which is going to be oh, great. Work. <laughs> if people don't know how the Theosophists and Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley are tied to uh, okay. Nazism and uh, and fascism more generally, um, this book is for you. It's overdue. Yeah. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. And so otherwise, if people do want, you know, we have a, a lot of author copies. So if people want to pick up any of our books, The Clash of the Two Americas, Volume 1 to 4, or The Untold History of Canada books, 1 to 4, um, or the, the Breaking Free of Anti-China PsyOps, um, you can get signed copies from my wife and myself or her mm -hmm. book by sending me an email to info at risingtidefoundation.net. Mm -hmm. If, you, if people would like to uh, listen to our weekly seminars, we do every Sunday experts uh, on various fields that are that, that give presentations on either history or science or whatever. Uh, that's every Sunday. So people can also write an email to that same email, info at risingtidefoundation.net, and I can I can give you the uh, the links to that. Otherwise, yeah, just stay up, stay up on my Better my web, yeah, free website or my sub stack. You know, that, 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 there's always good stuff that I try to put out there. Wow. Well, Matthew, it was really so grateful for your time and for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom and uh, really learned much. And I'm sure, you know, my listeners and followers too. Uh, so thank you so much again. And we hope we can, you know, uh, continue our conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, man. I look forward to the next uh, astroclimatology conversation. It'll be right. fun. And all right, take care. And we'll be in Austria. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will. All right. Okay, bye. bye.